Uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here. And uh, we uh, lucky to have the opportunity to share with the Bahia staff their success and the hope to continue the success for several years. The first speaker is the eminent professor of uh, uh, medical oncology, Professor Ahmed Bastawisi, who will talk about the target therapy in early luminal breast cancer. Professor Ahmed, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like also to thank all the team of Bahia for inviting me. My talk is titled Targeted Therapy in Early Luminal Breast Cancer. I will go th uh, through a, a small introduction and then through the role of CDK4-6 inhibitors in HR positive, HER2 negative, high risk early breast cancer, and then the evidence for PARP inhibitors in early breast cancer and the finally conclusions. So what do we know about the incidence of breast cancer in Egypt? is that breast cancer lies uh, uh, um, first was around 32% uh, of, uh, of cases followed by hepatocellular carcinoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. What about the distribution of early versus metastatic cases? Um, it differs according to the country with early breast cancer more detected in developed countries mainly uh, attributable to the uh, good screening programs. In Egypt, we have early breast cancer in around 86% of cases, whereas metastatic breast cancer is diagnosed in around 14%. When compared to the states, for example, on the um, left side of the screen, we have early breast cancer in around 94 up to 97, and metastatic breast cancer in only 3 to 6%. By definition, early breast cancer, and the next slides I'm talking about, early breast cancer defined, roughly speaking, by stage uh, uh, one and two. And if we look at the differences according to the, lumen, the, according to the molecular classification of breast cancer, we have luminal E and B. Luminal E in around 42 up to 60%, whereas luminal B up to 20%, HER2 enriched in up to 12%, and the triple negative in up to uh, 12, 20%. And as we know, luminal disease has uh, more probability to have grade one and two, and the four-year uh, survival is better in luminal as compared to uh, the other two types of molecular uh, breast cancer. And the initial uh, early breast cancer treatment failure within seven years is 8% in luminal A and uh, doubled in up to 16% in luminal B, whereas it is around 40% in triple negative disease. So what I want to say is that the prognosis of luminal breast cancer is definitely better than the other types. However, we still have some problems. For example, uh, around the 20 up to 30% of patients with early breast cancer will experience recurrences. And the early recurrences occur within the first two years of adjuvant treatments, which may represent endocrine resistance and around 50% of, re of recurrences occur within five years. And as we all know, whenever it is recurrent, it is incurable up till now. So in order to improve our results, we should identify which group we should uh, uh, go for uh, more intensification of treatment or what are the high risk uh, breast cancer patients. As we all know, there, there are uh, several factors which may attribute to the uh, recurrences of early breast cancer in up to 30% of cases. For example, young age at diagnosis, some morphologies, ductal versus lobular, large tumor size, high grade, symptomatic presentation, presence of high risk features like lymphovascular and neural invasion, positive lymph nodes, negative ER or overexpression of HER2, again, PR negativity, positive or close margins, high proliferation index and some histological subtypes, for example, metaplastic carcinoma. All these factors contribute to the early recur recurrence of uh, breast cancer. And if we look at the recurrence risk by intrinsic subtype, definitely, as I said, the luminal is better. But if we look at the tail of the, of the curve, again, when the uh, uh, years go on, the incidence of recurrence seems to be comparable between the different uh, molecular subtypes, whether luminal or non-luminal. So it is mainly a problem of early years after the diagnosis. So whenever we're going to 
uh, uh, intensify treatment, we should stress on the early periods of treatment. Again, if we look at the tumor recurrence by stage and by nodal status, definitely I'm not uh, presenting these slides to tell you that stage one is better than stage three or that lymph node positive is better than, uh, uh, is better than uh, lymph node negative, but I invite you to look at the um, left parts of the curves, where is the peaks of recurrences in regardless of stage and regardless of nodal status are present in the early years after diagnosis. So once again, whenever we want to intensify treatment, we should focus on the early years of diagnosis. And that is why the introduction of new drugs like CDK46 inhibitors in early breast cancer has been a very important topic of research. And we have many clinical trials, for example, the Monarch E4 uh, APIMA, I will go to it shortly. And again, we have several other clinical trials for CDK46 inhibitors, like, for example, the PALAS trial for palbocyclib and the PENLOP trial for neoadjuvant CDK46 inhibitor palbocyclib. And we have Natalie trial for ribocyclib, but I will be restricted to an example of these CDK46 inhibitors in early breast cancer, which is Monarch E trial. Monarch E included patients with HR positive, HER2 negative, node positive, high risk early breast cancer. And it included patients with four or more positive lymph nodes, whereas if the patient has one up to three positive lymph nodes, should be grade three, at least one of grade three or K67 of 20 or more, or tumor size of more than five centimeter. And the patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to APIMA in a standard dose of 150 by daily for up to two years. And as I showed, uh, I showed to you previously, the most important period of recurrence occurs in the early years of diagnosis of early breast cancer. So the design of Monarch e seems matched with the logic because we should intensify in the early years. With the standard care of endocrine therapy, whether five up to 10 years, it is not our matter, but uh, it is compared to a standard of care endocrine therapy and the patients we stratified according to the prior therapy meniboozal status and the region with a primary objective of invasive disease-free survival, which is a very important end point in the vast majority of early breast cancer trials. And again, secondary end points of invasive disease-free survival in high uh, K67 to any or more population and the distant relapse of free survival, overall survival safety, and patient reported outcome. So if we look at the cohort of Monarch is a cohort one included high risk population based on the classic clinical pathological features, which means four positive lymph nodes or one to three plus one of the following a grade three or tumor size more than five centimeter. And the cohort one represented the vast majority of patients around 91% of cases, whereas cohort two was mainly based on the biology which included patients with high K67, 20 or more, with no grade three and no tumor size more than five centimeter. And the uh, cohort two represented only around 9% of cases, of cases and patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either APIMA in uh, plus endocrine therapy versus standard endocrine therapy for two years, followed by a follow-up period of up to eight years. And if we look at the patient's characteristics between the two groups, it was more or less matched with a median age of around 51 in both arms. And the uh, majority of patients around 84 in both arms were uh, less than 65 years. And the vast majority of patients, almost 99% are females. Uh, around uh, yani a slim majority of patients, 52 in, in both arms, were coming from North America and Europe, and the uh, majority of patients were postmenopausal. One third of patients in both arms received prior treatment, and the vast majority of patients were ECOG performance status zero. And let's look at the primary endpoint. We can easily notice that there is wide separation of the invasive disease-free survival curves in favor of the addition of the CDK46 APIMA as compared to the standard of care alone was a three rate of around 88.8 versus only 83.4 in the hormonal treatment only arm and a hazard ratio of around 0.69 corresponding to around 31% decreasing the incidence of invasive disease occurrence in favor of APIMA once again. And if we look at the predefined 
uh, treatment groups, we can easily notice that it is once again in favor of addition of CDK46 inhibitor, regardless of the number of lymph nodes, regardless of the grade, tumor size, prior chemotherapy, and regardless of whatever subgroup analysis, all the events are in favor of the addition of ABIMA. If we look at the secondary endpoint of distant relapse-free survival, once again, the three years was 90.3 as compared to 86% uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.68 corresponding to 32%, decreasing the incidence of distant relapse with the addition of abima as compared to hormonal treatment alone. And if we look at the, our preferable endpoint of overall survival, we can easily notice that there is no overlapping more than that, denoting no survival difference for the addition of ABIMA. However, it seems that uh, 27 months median duration of follow-up is not a sufficient period for follow-up of patients in a curable intent uh, setting like adjuvant breast cancer. What was uh, more beautiful is that the benefit of CDK4-6 inhibitor was maintained in either IDFS or DRFS with uh, uh, progression of the years, it was improved from year uh, one up to uh, two and plus with a hazard ratio of 0.59 and 0.69 respectively, denoting that the value is increasing over years. And if we look at patients who received the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the value may be more in uh, the arm of CDK46 inhibitors with a two-year IDFS of 87 versus around 80% and a, a significant hazard ratio of 0.61 corresponding to 39% decrease in the incidence of IDF IDFS, which may reflect the uh, more demanding population because patients who receive the neoadjuvant treatment definitely are uh, of higher uh, stage or higher grading denoting that they are more demanding for intensification of treatment. And if we look at the DRFS, we once again can easily notice that the curves are in favor of the addition of CDK46 with a, a more significant hazard ratio when compared to the intent to treat population, denoting once again a more demanding population. So the FDA approval population in this setting was four or more uh, positive axillary lymph node or one to three axillary lymph node plus grade three or tumor size more than five centimeter plus biologically uh, more uh, proliferative, for example, K67 of 20 or more. However, this is not no more indication and we are depending on uh, the uh, clinical pathological features more. Because if we look at the invasive disease free survival in patients with high K67, Yes, the value may be more with around the three year rate of uh, seven uh, of um, um, 86 percent versus only 79 percent and the hazard ratio 0.62 more than the intended to treat population. And if we look at again the RFS in high K67 population, once again, the hazard ratio is more around 60%, denoting a 40% decrease in the incidence of DRFS in favor of the addition of CDK46 inhibitor, which just means that it is a more demanding population. But if we look at the prognostic value of K67, and the above two curves are, are for patients with high K67 and the below two curves are for patients with low K67. And regardless of being high or low, the uh, value of addition of uh, APIMA is maintained regardless of being high or low, which means that K67 is not a good predictive marker for this population setting, but it is a rather prognostic marker. And that is why I, I, I see that the omission of K67 as a prerequisite for incorporation of APIMA in the early breast cancer seems logic and based on a strong evidence. What about the cost or the adverse events? If we look at the uh, toxicity, we have our diarrhea, fatigue, arthralgia, neutropenia, which was more or less comparable with the previous reports of ABIMA cyclib with no new safety signals. And the most adverse events or whether diarrhea, neutropenia, or fatigue was grade one and two, and the grade three and more occurred in, uh, mostly in, in, um, in neutropenia around 19%, followed by leukopenia 11%. However, again, the majority of adverse events were manageable and the grade one and two. 
So based on Monarch E, we have now a new weapon in early breast cancer, which is a Pima cycle acidic 4 6 inhibitor. Another group, which is BRCA mutant breast cancer, which we know that it uh, uh, makes the patient prone to uh, breast cancer. For example, the lifetime risk of breast cancer is around 12%, which corresponds to one out of eight cases, as we always said. But if we have BRCA mutation, it, it is up to 70%. And if BRCA2, it is uh, uh, again 69%. For, for ovarian, the risk in the normal population is 1% to 2%. It is up to 60%. If we have BRCA1 mutation, and if we have BRCA2, it is around 30%. And the similar figures are, are, are uh, again true for pancreatic and the prostate cancer. So definitely, if we have BRCA, we are more, more prone to certain malignancies. Fortunately, the incidence of BRCA mutation in unselected breast cancer is around 5%. Uh, and if we look at, again, the uh, prevalence in patients with a family history, if we have three family members with breast cancer, it is around 3.7%. But if we have two females with breast, uh, one of them is less than the age of 51. And as we know, the median age of breast cancer is 65. If it is younger, we have uh, more probability to be genetically driven, it rises to up to 18%. But if we have two females with ovarian cancer, this is the highest incidence, around the 40%. And if we have one female member with breast and one female will, with ovarian, it is around the 41%. And the uh, high proportion of patients of uh, terrible neg negative breast cancer have BRCA mutations around the 17%, which is around triple the number in luminal or HR positive disease around 6%. However, in practice, the um, majority of BRCA mutations are found in HR positive disease. And this is simply because the prevalence of HR positive, which is around 17%, uh, is higher as compared to basal or triple negative breast cancer. So what we know is that BRCA mutation uh, 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 allows the uh, more exposure to breast cancer. Uh, uh, and the clinical wise, BRCA mutant breast cancer patients are younger, higher grade, higher probability of having CNS meds and a higher probability again to have contralateral disease. And as we know that PARB inhibitors act by, by trapping uh, PARB on a single strand break. So when conversion of single strand to double strand break occurs in the replicating cells, the um, normal cells can repair this by the, H by the HRR pathway, whereas the BRCA mutant breast cancer are deficient in the mechanisms of DNA repair, and this makes them more prone to uh, inst genomic instability and the cell death. So why not to target this pathway? We have Olympia trial, which was previously described in um, Olympia E, which examined the Olaparib, and it showed uh, a primary endpoint of IDFS and the DRFS Previously, and in this report, we report is the second interim analysis of overall sur survival. And if we look at the inclusion criteria, the I they are either genetically uh, having a BRCA mutation or a, pot a potential BRCA mutation. And there the are two groups, neoadjuvant and adjuvant, adjuvant randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to Olaparib versus placebo with a primary endpoint uh, uh, of IDFS and secondary endpoint of DDFS and overall survival. And if we look at the groups of inclusion in the Olympia, we have leominal disease, HR positive with four uh, uh, positive lymph nodes or which have uh, didn't attain complete pathological response on neoadjuvant and having a KPS EG score of more than three, I will be shortly uh, tackling this issue. Or terrible negative breast cancer with positive lymph node or tumor size of two centimeter or more, or patients in the neoadjuvant setting not attaining a complete pathological response. And this score is developed by the MD Anderson and the simply it stands for uh, um, clinical stage and the pathological stage ER status and the nuclear grade and the, every patient is scored from one to five with one and the two low score and the five and six high score and the Olympia included patients from three and on. If we look at the patient's characteristics, it is more or less matched in both arms. But if we look at the 
uh, primary endpoint of invasive disease-free survival, it was in favor of the addition of Olaparibo, the 85% versus only 77% with a hazard ratio of around 0.58% corresponding to around 42% decrease in the incidence of invasive disease-free survival. Same results for the distant uh, disease-free survival. Again, the overall survival rebels were, was in favor of the addition of Olaparib. And if we look at updated analysis just presented in the uh, ISMO virtual last year, we can easily notice that the, there is improvement of the IGFS curves in favor of the addition of Olaparib. Overall survival, once again, was much more improved either after three years and maintained after four years. And the second overall sur survival interim analysis after three and four years was once again in favor of, a beam of addition of uh, Ola Barib in all the subgroups with a more manageable toxicity uh, profile. So in conclusion, we have now two new families working in the setting of early breast cancer. One of them is, uh, is the CDK46 inhibitor represented by Abima cyclib, and one of them is a PARV inhibitor represented by the Olaparib, and this may yield uh, better uh, results for patients with early leominal disease. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. The floor is open for one question. Anyone want to ask uh, Professor Ahmed? Dr. Ahmed, the patient with BRCA mutation and uh, after uh, primary surgery, would you give adjuvant uh, olaparib or you give adjuvant immunotherapy? We have the choice of both. Uh, yeah, very important question. The, the data for uh, um, in, in BRCA mutant triple negative, for example, the role of immunotherapy, as you know, is in the triple negative setting, in the neoadjuvant adjuvant setting, but immunotherapy is only approved if it is given in the neoadjuvant setting. So if we miss the new adjuvant phase of immunotherapy in triple negative disease, we are not allowed as per the inclusion criteria for the for the trial to incorporate immunotherapy in the adjuvant setting. We have only the option of uh, adjuvant olaparib. And the comparison maybe here, if we have uh, a, the, um, the same criteria for uh, addition of CDK4-6 inhibitors. So the question will be more valid to whether to give olaparib or to give CDK4-6 inhibitor in the adjuvant setting. And we do not have data because simply we do not have uh, a, a level one evidence for this. Uh, but I guess it, it, if the incidence of BRCA is very low, around less than 5%. And the probability of matching the inclusion criteria of CDK46 abima is much more in this population because we can have easily patients with four or more positive lymph nodes or one to three with uh, grade three and, and so on. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor, my dear friend, Professor uh, Mahir Hassan for this kind invitation and uh, prestigious uh, conference. Also, Professor Amari Hilal. Uh, let me introduce my dear friend, uh, Professor Yazan uh, Mazanat. Uh, Professor Yazan, I asked one of my colleagues to give me more information uh, about Professor Yazan. Uh, yeah, he gave me a lot of information. I can't talk uh, about all of this, but uh, Professor Yazan is a consultant of uh, oncoplastic breast surgery at uh, a bird in the Royal uh, Infirmary, and also one of the associated postgraduate uh, deans of NHS Education for Scotland. He's a honorary uh, senior clinical lecturer at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, mm -hmm. and he's also uh, one of the members of examiners at the European Board of Surgical Oncology and the European Board of uh, Breast Surgery. Uh, Professor Yazan has more than 40 publications and has been awarded numerous research grants, and uh, also is a curator for the website of ibreastbook.com uh, that is available free for all members. Uh, Professor Yazan will talk about the uh, controversy in Central and Field in Breast Surgery. Please, Professor Yazan. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this, uh, to be on the fifth Bahia Breast Cancer Conference in uh, Cairo. It's great to be here in Egypt with friends and colleagues. And many thanks for the lovely uh, 
introduction. So I'm one of, one of the surgeons in Aberdeen. Uh, the only reason to mention the eye breast book again here is mainly because we run some free educational events. If you want to join, they're all for free. Uh, please feel free for that. Uh, those events are mainly uh, sponsored by some of the companies, but there's no conflict of interest to uh, mention here. There's lots of controversies in sentinel node biopsy. I'm going to talk about two, if time helps. Uh, we'll concentrate on the post neoadjuvant chemotherapy sentinel node biopsy. But if we have time, we will talk about the redo sentinel node biopsy. So as we all know, neoadjuvant chemotherapy was originally used to, for inoperable tumors to downstage the disease to make them operable and facilitate surgery. But with time, we started getting more indications for uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now we're doing it to downstage tumors to make uh, surgery less extensive, to improve conservation rate and cosmesis. And now we're using it also to understand biology more, uh, mainly to, to, for the triple negative and the HER2 positive disease, to see if there is any uh, response to treatment that will guide further local, regional, and systemic treatments. Everybody talks about the breast. Nobody talks about the axilla. What about the axilla here? In the past, everybody had a clearance. It's an awful operation, and I hope in the years to come, this operation will disappear. Sentinel node biopsy started replacing clearances in the clinically and radiologically node negative axilla. And initially, for the knee adjuvant chemotherapy patients, we started doing the sentinel node biopsy before chemotherapy. But if you look at the NSABP B18, which looked at chemotherapy response published years ago, for clinically node positive axillas, 89% had some sort of response. 74% had complete clinical response and 44% had complete pathological response. So why are we doing clearances? At that stage, there was some shift towards doing the uh, sentinel node biopsy after finishing chemotherapy rather than before doing the chemotherapy. And that's what most people do now, but that raised the questions of accuracy. With chemotherapy, there'll be some fibrosis, there'll be fat necrosis, there'll be scarring. Lymphatic drainage might change and might be affected. Tissue handling, we, we all operated on patients that had chemotherapy, the tissue is completely different. And tumor response in the axilla might be very variable. Most studies have showed there is lower identification rate for sentinel node biopsy, post adjuvant chemotherapy. So should we be doing this at all? We need to divide this talk to a couple of talks because we need to look at the negative axilla before chemotherapy and the positive axilla before chemotherapy. And the first paper that we look at is from France, the Gania study. They looked at both uh, negative and positive axillas. So for the negative axilla before chemotherapy, sentinel node biopsy success rate was nearly 95% with a false negative rate less than 10%, 9.4%, which is acceptable. This is great numbers. And if you look at this paper by uh, the MD Anderson group, had very similar results, 97% identification rate with a false negative rate of 6%. And there's a beautiful review by Monica Moro looking at axillary nodal management following the adjuvant chemotherapy in JAMA network. And in node negative, clinically and radiologically node negative before chemotherapy, sentinel node biopsy is accurate. So we tick the first box, but what about the ones that were positive before chemotherapy? So for the clinically node positive, either they become pathologically, uh, sorry, post chemotherapy, they become, they stay positive or they become negative radiologically. So the one that stay positive radiologically, we still do clearances because that's what we do. For the ones that are negative, those are the ones that we are addressing now in the literature. Is sentinel node biopsy accurate in that cohort? We go back to the Gania study from France. And in their cohort, if you remember, the negative ones had nearly 95% identification rate, but the positive ones had 81% identification rate, which is not great. And the false negative rate went up to 15%, which is not acceptable. There's another great study by uh, Thurston Kuhn and the team uh, in Europe, the Sentina study had, was uh, slightly complex in the way they arranged it. But if you look with me at ARMC, so the clinically node positive disease, 
that was converted to clinically node negative disease. They done sentinel node biopsy and then axillary node dissection. And in that, they found that the detection rate is also quite low, 80%. False negative is quite high, nearly 15%. But look at the numbers now. If there was one node taken on the sentinel node, then the false negative rate is 24%. If it's two nodes, it's 14%. If it's three nodes, it's 4.9%. And that's where we're starting to get some of the guidelines. And if you look at the Z1071, which is nearly 10 years old now, very similar findings, identification rate of 92%, false negative of 12%. Here also they looked if you use a dual technique, the false negative went to 10%, whereas a single agent was 20%. And if you get two nodes only, it's 21%. But if you get the three or more nodes, it's less than percent, which is the false negative rate that we accept. And the meta-analysis that published in the BJS uh, from the team in Ireland. This is where most of the guidelines started coming in 2018. 13 studies, nearly 2,000 patients, 90% identification rate, the same with a dual mapping, 11%, with single agent, nearly 20%. And the false negative rates, you can see it's quite high for one nodes and two nodes. But if you have three or more nodes, it's quite low. The authors concluded that sentinel node is accurate and reliable, but requires careful patient selection. But that did not give us the answer. People are still not accepting sentinel node biopsy after new adjuvant chemotherapy when there's complete response radiologically. And we don't have any data to look at impact on local recurrence or disease-free survival. Many people believe that axillary surgery is a staging operation and we should treat it as such. Then people started thinking, we're missing the positive node. Why don't we mark it? It's, we just put a marker clip in it. So we put the clip in the tumor bed to find the tumor bed if they have complete response to help our pathology colleagues to get the tumor. Why don't we mark it? And this is the paper from 2016, the concept of targeted axillary dissection came by the team from MD Anderson by Henry Cure. And what they've done, they marked the previously positive node and They've done a sentinel node biopsy and they've taken the marked node and the combination of sentinel node biopsy and the marked node is called targeted axillary dissection. And you can see the false negative rate or sentinel node biopsy alone was 10%. Targeted lymph node biopsy, which is mainly the only the positive nodes that was marked was 4%. And when you combine them with a the TAD is 1.4%. And then people started thinking, how can we uh, use different localization techniques to localize the nodes in the axilla because it's not easy to localize the axilla. People have used carbon tattooing, ultrasound scans, wires, and the new probe guided techniques. And we'll talk briefly about all those. Remember, when you do a target dissection, you mark the node, but you still need to do a dual technique sentinel node biopsy. So the carbon tattooing. You see Thorsten Kuhn mentioned in many of the papers regarding the axilla in, in Europe. And the carbon tattooing is mainly, you just put a needle for the radiologist, they'll find where's the positive node, they inject carbon and they keep on injecting uh, along the tract and you follow the tract to find the center node, the, sorry, the targeted node. They do it, did it on 110 patients. Identification rate was quite high, 93.6%. Uh, the targeted lymph node was the same as the sentinel node biopsy in only 60% of the patients. And that's a very important number. And you'll see most of the other papers are showing the same number. So if you do only a sentinel node biopsy, you're highly likely to miss the previously positive node. So false negative rate in their uh, study was 9%, which is acceptable. This is very cheap, but you might need more dissection because you need to follow that tract. Then there's the ELINA trial by the team from uh, Barcelona, not Barcelona, from Madrid by Isabel Rubio, where they do ultrasound scans to, to look for the hydromark in the positive node. 46 patients, identification rate of 96%, which is great. Meaning they, they missed two patients out of the 46. Using intraoperative ultrasound scan to find the node. But the problem, you need to have good experience with an ultrasound scan especially that you're not looking for a tumor, you're looking for a clip in an axilla in a small wound. So it's not for everybody. And people looked at the good old wire, but is it time for the wire to retire? It's uh, many people are shying away from the wires now. And if you look 
for those, this little study, 30 patients, they were able to put the wire in the axilla in only 80%, 24 patients. But even when you put the wire in the node, the clip node identification rate was 70%. The wire does move, uh, especially in the axilla. And if you look at the center study, had much bigger cohort of 500 plus patients, still the same. Uh, target lymph node biopsy was only accurate in about 77.8%. They couldn't put the wire in many of those axillas. So interoperative ultrasound scan uh, is good in experienced hands, which is not easy. And wire localization is not really that great. What about other techniques? So the radioactive seeds have been used. The research study is mainly from, the, from Holland. We still don't have results from that, but from our private communication with Ernest uh, Van Luyten, who's reading that, he said the identification rate is quite high. Uh, the mag seed have been used in the axilla, described in small cohorts uh, of 40 patients, 100% identification rate. You will not miss it if you have a seed in it. The seed will just fibrose and sit there nicely. But remember the number of 60%, so the concordance with the center node biopsy was only 65%. And there's lots of other new techniques. People are starting to explore using them in the axilla. So we can find the node and stage the axilla. So what? What does that mean? So we agreed that if they're still positive after chemotherapy, they need clearance, but if they're negative, clinically and radiologically, then pathologically, if they're positive, and pathologically positive node in the axilla post-chemotherapy is micromets and macromets, not only macromets. So even if it's a micromet, it's still positive for us. And what do you do if it's negative pathologically? And those are lots of questions that we don't have answer for. But if you look at this paper with a 10-year follow-up from Milan, they've been doing target dissections for, uh, not target dissections, uh, center node biopsy after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so the patients that had clinically node positive axilla N1, N2, that became negative, the axillary failure rate was 1.8%. And the patients that had clinically node negative axilla before and after chemotherapy, the failure rate was 1.5%. So there's no difference. So why do you want to dissect that axilla? There's many questions still to answer. If we're doing a target dissection, how many nodes we need in total? And the pathologically complete response. Can we leave the axilla and not do anything? And in the patients that had matted nodes or heavily involved axilla, is it safe to do a target dissection if they have a complete response? Those are questions that have not been answered. And for the clinically node positive that becomes node negative, and they're still found to be node positive on pathology, Radiologically, there is small burden disease. Do we need to clear them or can we just do a radiotherapy for that? The Axana study from Europe, also led by Thurston Kuhn, and the ATNIC from the UK are addressing those. They're multi-center studies that will randomize patients once we confirm that they have responded completely in the axilla or pathologically negative axilla post chemo to either treatment or no treatment arm. So in clinically node negative patients, center node biopsy is safe. And the node positive patients, please clip the node first so that you can get it. If you don't clip it, then there's only 60, 65% chance that you'll get it with a center node biopsy on its own. If it's clinically node negative uh, after chemotherapy, if it responds, please try to conserve the axilla, do a target dissection. But if they are still pathologically positive and clinically positive, you need to treat. So if it's clinically positive before you do any surgery, you do a clearance. If it's pathologically positive, you assume that the nodal burden is low, you can look at clearance or radiotherapy. But we don't know still if we can omit further treatments for the ones that have converted completely. Most likely, yes. So that's part one. I'm going to touch on redo central node biopsies. And what we mean by redo central node biopsy is we know that central node biopsy is a gold standard for staging clinically and radiologically node negative axilla, but there is little or no published data other than some prospective randomized, no, no, no randomized trials, there's some retrospective cohort studies looking at central node biopsy in patients that had previous breast cancer. So they had previous conservation, had previous breast cancer, you need to do a completion mastectomy. Can we do a center node biopsy? So 
in the literature, there's some retrospectives, uh, the data with various recruitment strategy papers that has conducted in a range of settings. And the technique success rate was ranging from 55% to 77%. It depends on lots of confounding factors. And there was a meta-analysis published two years ago that highlighted the weakness of the literature with heterogeneity in the surgical technique, mapping methods, and radiation history. And the success rate was about 71%. False negative rates was less than 10%, which is acceptable, but the success rate was quite low. So what we have done, we have looked at our data. I don't think that you'll have any RCTs to address in the future. You only have retrospective, maybe if you're lucky, some prospective studies in the future. So we looked at our data, six years, a thousand mastectomies, 86 had recurrent disease or new epsilateral primary. Sometimes you don't need to differentiate between them because all what you need to do is to stage the axilla here. And in the old days before, we used to always do an axillary node sample. And I joined the Aberdeen in 2014. I started doing some central node biopsies for those patients. And you can see the trend of changing. We're doing mainly central node biopsies now rather than axillary node samples. Out of the 48 that had redo central node biopsy when the ejected blue dye plus minus, sorry, uh, the technician plus minus the blue dye, the success rate was 72%. But those are patients that did not have clearances before. If you've cleared an axilla, you should not get any nodes there. But most of those ladies had previous either axilla node sample or central node biopsy. If it's not you that has cleared the axilla, you might want to do some uh, injection of a tracer to check if you can find anything there. So 86 in total, if you look at the central node on the right side, 35 successful, 13 are not successful. The one that are not successful, then you go default, you do your sample. So you haven't lost anything. And two have failed completely because we could not have their old nodes. Uh, most likely they had previous clearances. So the success rate was significantly lower among patients that had previous axillary surgery because some ladies had previous radiotherapy with only DCIS. So a wide local excision with DCIS, axillary not touched. And some people are reluctant to do a center node biopsy arguing that uh, the radiotherapy will, uh, will disrupt the lymphatics and will, it will not be successful, but it's more likely it will be successful. And previously positive axillas, many of our cohorts had uh, axillary node sample followed by radiotherapy and that has increased the failure rate more than 50%. And previous radiotherapy, not every radiotherapy is radiotherapy. So we looked at radiotherapy to the breast, to the axilla, and to the SCF. So the ladies that had previous radiotherapy to the breast and axilla, including SCF, those are the ones that had higher failure rate. So success was not associated with previous type of surgery, center node or a sample. And the time lag between the cancer and the recurrence did not affect that. So if you've done it in two years after with the recurrence or the recurrence was 20 years after, there was no difference in the identification rate. So you always need to rethink and consider restaging the axilla in patients with previous history of epsilateral cancer, especially that there is growing evidence that there is some identification rate. If you put your dye and your tracer and they don't go to the axilla, then do the old fashioned sample or clearance or whatever you're going to do before. And that's my time. Thank you very much for uh, putting up with me for the past 20 minutes. Thank you, Professor Yazan. Uh, this is an excellent presentation in uh, an area of debate in, uh, in breast surgery. Uh, so uh, anyone of the floor want to ask uh, Professor Yazan? Professor Khaled. Um, thank you for the nice presentation. I'm just asking about clipping of the node and identification, because it seems that clipping the node for anyone who not, did not work on it operatively, that it's something easy or simple to get it. But I think it's not that easy. So you told us about the intraoperative using of the ultrasound, and maybe the wire, which is not now that um, common uh, as before, but didn't you try like uh, tattooing with uh, carbon particles as we sometimes do in, um, in our center or our, any other method? So what we do is we use the max seeds. 
so it's much easier for us to use the max seeds. But there is a paper that I've shown. It's not available yes. also. Yeah. But there's, there's a paper. The first paper that I showed was by, uh, I think, Stephanie Hartman and uh, Kuhn that talked about the uh, carbon tattooing. And the identification rate with the tattooing is more than 90%, which is great, excellent. Might need a bit more dissection, but it's quite cheap and it's very easy to use. So if it works, it works. Why not? As long as you can get the node, that's that's all what you need. Thank you, Azam, for the nice presentation. As usual, uh, I have a question about the timing where you clip the node. Do you uh, clip the node at the same time you, you biopsy it or not? Because this will add more uh, more clips. In, might be free axella. I know that the axella trial is, is answering a lot of questions of this, but there is eight years to come. Second point I'd like to ask you about, what if the ultrasound showed that this node is a little bit suspicious and you biopsy it and come negative? Would you still mark it or not? So what we do is when we clip the node, so when, when we have a node, we do cytology and biopsy on the, on the spot. So if one of them is positive, then we put a hydro mark in the axilla because it's very expensive to put a magnetic seat for 300 pounds. The hydro mark is only 20 pounds or less. Now, if they have a complete pathological response or radiological response after chemotherapy, then the radiologist will target the hydro mark to put the magnetic seat next to the hydro mark. So you need something cheap to put first because less than 50% of the axillas will have a complete response. Now, if you have a node that looks pathological on ultrasound scan and the biopsy is negative, we will repeat the biopsy. And if the radiologist is happy with a second biopsy, then we'll be happy with that. Let's differentiate between a B1 axilla and a B2 axilla. So if there is, a, there's, there is axillary tissue that shows no disease and shows something that will explain the slightly enlarged node, that's fine. But if it looks completely pathological, we'll repeat the biopsy. And if the radiologist is still not happy, as long as we have two, and sometimes we do three repeat biopsies, if they're all negative, we'll treat it as negative. So as for the first question, those uh, is the hydromark where they came negative. You leave the hydromark, you don't target it anymore. So the ones that have the hydromark, if it becomes negative, that's when we put the mag C to do a target dissection. If it stays positive, they're going to have a clearance, so the hydromark no. will come out anyway. My question was about you put the mark before waiting for the pathology. If it, if, if it looks if it looks very abnormal, yes, yes. you put it yes. If if there, okay. if if it's suspicious, sometimes we don't do that. We do a cytology and biopsy and then wait for the result. But if it looks grossly abnormal, then they will put the mark at the same time. Yeah. Thank you. Please, uh, yes. The last panel of NCN shows that you can do targeted axillary dissection without any adjuvant chemotherapy. If you have only one or two positive nodes and the patient will do upfront surgery, you can clip the one or two nodes and do TED without any adjuvant chemotherapy. Do you use this in your management? We don't use it locally. That's another area of debate on how to treat the axilla. As I said in my first the beginning of the talk, I think axillary node clearance is an awful surgery. At one stage, we will stop doing clearances. So many people are starting to clip the abnormal nodes, take the abnormal nodes, as you say, and do a targeted uh, dissection, even without uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but that's not the standard that we have. Anyway, most of the ag positive axillas will need chemotherapy. If you have somebody with a positive axilla, why don't you give them the chemotherapy up front anyway? If it's one or two lymph nodes, you can do up front. If she luminal, uh, low grade, and one or two positive nodes, uh, we can do up front surgery. T1 or T2 and one or two nodes positive. Well, that, that's what we don't do locally there. That's something that some other places will do. Uh, not everybody will do the same thing. So in our local policy, it's still, unfortunately, a clearance. Thank you. Any other question? Professor Ahmed Tarek. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I just want to ask about, do you embark doing the second sentinel lymph node biopsy? Um, you're encouraged to do it when the interval of recurrence is bigger after uh, the first surgery, or is the interval of surgery doesn't, you don't put it in, into account? I really cannot hear the question. The, the, okay. Sorry. Uh, any patient having recurrence? Yes. After the, whatever, breast conservation, for example, what type of patients you embark on doing a second sentinel biopsy? Do you consider the interval between the surgery and the occurrence of recurrence 
important or not. Not really. When we looked at our data, there was, there was no significance in the patients that had recurrence mm -hmm. within a year or two or recurrence 20 years after. So if somebody had a clearance and they had the clearance locally and then we know that they had a good clearance and radiologically there's nothing in the axilla, we'll do nothing. If somebody had a previous center node biopsy, or had an axillary node sample, and we have a pathology to suggest that there was small nodal count, like three or four nodes, that's when we consider redo sentinel node biopsy. So what we do is we inject the technician. In the study that we've done, we were not doing uh, lymphocytograms. Now we're doing lymphocytograms also at the same time to help us see where it is. If you have a positive axillary reading from the technician, then I don't always inject the blue dye. If you don't have anything, you'll, you'll combine it with a blue dye. And if it fails and you don't get any blue dye there or any technetium, then you do whatever you're going to do before, which is mainly what we do locally is axillary node sample. Scotland is quite heavy on axillary node samples, but where I trend in England, for example, they will do a level one uh, on those patients. What do you mean by axillary sampling? What we look for four nodes only. Yeah, any four nodes that haven't taken any, it's that the, the Edinburgh study that was in the late 1990s that looked at the four node sample. So we try to palpate and find four nodes, even if they don't have any uh, blue dye or technetium and we'll do a random sample. So yeah, you're proposing the idea that you're going to do a center, second sentinel, second sentinel lymphoma biopsy uh, in an attempt that you're going to preserve, uh, not doing excessive, you're not going to, lose anything if you're going to find an, uh, a second yeah. center lymph node. So you're doing it, you're de-escalating the axilla. Yes. Because if you go again, the axilla with all the scarring, with the radiotherapy that she, the lady had before, with the scarring that she had, and you do extensive dissection, the chance of lymphedema is very high. And there is no, nothing to suggest that it will give her any survival benefit. There's nothing to suggest that it will be a higher local recurrence rate. So why to give her lymphedema for nothing? Uh, just just two questions, quick questions about the axilla. Um, uh, the first one is, what would you do if you have more than three positive nodes uh, with imaging? Uh, would you go for center lymph node biopsy or if there's, is, there, is there any much evidence about it? And the second question is, what if you have two to three nodes? Would you clip all of them or just one or two? So those are things that we always argue about. Now, we are part, we are part of the ATMIC trial. In our local protocol, we're, we're, we're accepting only N1 axillas, so up to three positive nodes. So the radiologist will document on the first that if they have more, four or more abnormal lymph glands, then we will just give them a clearance even if they responded completely to chemotherapy. But if you look at the Axana trial, the one that is run by Eobress and Thorsten Kuhn, they also include N2 axillas. Our locally, we don't do that but they do include as N2 axillas. And sometimes you have, especially the HER2 positive disease, you have an axilla that has six or seven positive nodes, you do the clearance and you have complete response in seven or eight nodes and the rest is negative. And uh, the question about clipping two or more nodes, sometimes we do, but we don't always. The short answer for that. Thank you. Romar. If I didn't uh, clip uh, the node, the positive node uh, was not clipped, can I proceed for sentinel lymph node after downstaging? So if you look at the data, if you do the sentinel node, let's say that you have a proven node uh, to be positive on biopsy, and you do a sentinel node, there's 30 to 40% chance that you will miss that node. So if you have your pathology and the pathology does not show any node that had previous cancer in it, how do you know that you have done the correct surgery? Hmm. So okay. that would be the question. Most likely that the breast and the axilla is a, is a forgiving thing. So most likely when you do the radiotherapy, you ask your clinical oncologist to irrigate the axilla and get away with it, but you haven't done an accurate staging there. So in the past, what we've done is we've done center nodes, we haven't marked the axilla. And if there is a pathologically, uh, there is a node that has shows pathological response and shows a biopsy track, because the biopsy track will always be there, then you know that you have got it, the correct one. But in one third of the patients, you will not get the correct one. And then you need to reconsider, do I need to go back in and do a clearance anyway? So that's why it's better to target that node, to clip that node. So if you look at the meta-analysis, if you take three or more nodes, the false negative rate goes significantly below 
Thank you, Professor Yazan. Uh, Unfortunately for uh, the time, uh, excuse us uh, to, to finish this uh, discussion. And uh, we have a promise from uh, Professor Yazan to have uh, a separate discussion on the management of Central Infinite, maybe tomorrow. I'm more, more than happy to discuss. So if anybody wants to yeah, have okay. any questions, we'll have a chat. Thank you, Thank Professor you for Yazan. Our next speaker will be Professor Yasser Salam, and uh, we'll be having a talk about the current management of HER2 new positive metastatic breast cancer. Thank you, um, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to have um, the opportunity to give this lecture uh, about her to positive uh, breast cancer. And um, inshallah, we'll start um, as soon as possible uh, to get uh, the time. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, systemic therapy is a mainstay of treatment for metastatic breast cancer. And uh, as we know that uh, systemic therapy is not um, curative for those patients, but it improves the patient outcomes. And the median survival of those patients um, in the 80s, in uh, 1985, it was about 13 months, and it reached about 37.2 months in 2018 with five-year survival rate increasing from 10 to 27 during the same period. HER2 overexpression or amplification is found in about 20% of metastatic breast cancer cases, activating downstream signaling of mitogen-activated protein kinase and phosphonistole 3 kinase, leading to cell proliferation. Uh, namely, or specifically, trastuzumab markedly improved the outcome of those four subtypes of uh, of uh, metastatic breast cancer patients. Uh, this is uh, the timeline for uh, uh, chemotherapeutics and the treatment received um, over the past decades, uh, starting from uh, for anti-HER2 treatment with trastuzumab, uh, which was discovered in 1998, and the progressing to lapatinib, pertuzumab, and finally we have a long list of drugs treating those patients. Uh, target therapy have changed the range of course of HER2 positive disease. Uh, several therapeutic blocking in HER2 signaling were developed like trastuzumab, pertuzumab, uh, antibody drug conjugates, and small molecules like tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And the emerging treatment options uh, range from novel anti-HER2 antibodies, by specific antibodies, T-cell dependent by specific antibodies, antibody drug conjugates, TKIs, CDK46 and immune checkpoint inhibitors. Trastuzumab has radically improved the prognosis for HER2 positive breast cancer. The HER2 positive breast cancer has gone from worst to the best or the first because of the success of monoclonal antibody like trastuzumab in combination with chemotherapy. And a study for more than 4,000 patients published in 2014 showed that addition of trastuzumab concurrent with chemotherapy led to about 37% relative improvement in survival, increasing the 10-year survival to 84 from 75. The HERA trial found that one year of trastuzumab adjuvant therapy was optimal. However, the FAIR trial published in 2013 found that six months of trastuzumab is almost as equal. Pertuzumab, when added to trastuzumab, complementary to trastuzumab action, inhibiting ligand-dependent HER2, HER3 dimerization, and reducing signaling through anthracerobus ways like phosphinistole 3 kinase and the protein kinase B. Um, pertuzumab was explored in the Cleopatra trial who, which randomized patients with HER2-positive disease, metastatic, uh, metastatic patients, to receive either uh, trastuzumab with docetaxel plus or minus pertuzumab. Pertuzumab produced or gave those patients an overall survival of 57% compared to 40 months. 
and eight year landmark of road survival of 37% as compared to standard 23% with trastuzumab only in the placebo group. Uh, chemotherapy plus anti HER2 therapy um, uh, is well known to be effective in those patients. But what about uh, the anti HER2 treatment? Is it enough to give those anti HER2 treatment without chemotherapy? I mean, or the question is uh, whether chemotherapy is an essential part uh, that is indispensable because we have a lot of patients who cannot tolerate the side effects of chemotherapy the side effects of chemotherapy. So chemotherapy plus anti-HER2 is currently the standard of treatment in HER2 positive breast cancer, but the escalation of treatment is being investigated. In the adapted trial with HER2 positive disease, uh, they compare two lines of treatment, whether to give the patient trastuzumab, pertuzumab alone, or plus uh, baclitaxel. Uh, the triplet therapy with the baclitaxel trastuzumab pertuzumab produced a survival of 98% versus 87% among those receiving an anti 2 treatment only without chemotherapy. So uh, the difference was not statistically significant. However, because of this difference in survival, uh, we continue to recommend the combination of chemotherapy plus anti 2 treatment for most patients. Um, next drug that we're going to speak about, about the second line, TDM1 was explored in the immediate trial for those patients with HER2 positive locally advanced or metastatic breast cancer. Those patients were randomized to receive either CAPLAB versus TDM1, and TDM1 produced a higher survival for those patients. Um, the third drug uh, that we're going to speak about uh, is deroxtecan trastuzumab. Uh, deroxtecan trastuzumab is, a, is a, uh, a representation of the antibody drug conjugate, which is a combination of humanized anti-HER2 immunoglobulin G1 monoclonal antibody connected or linked to toboisomerase 1 inhibitor called deroxtecan. Trastuzumab deroxtecan uh, produced an, a response rate of about 61% with a median progression free survival of 16 months. Uh, for heavily pretreated patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Trastuzumab deroxtecan, uh, based on this study, was uh, approved by FDA for treatment for heavily pretreated HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Um, the only issue with this drug is the interstitial lung disease, which is an important risk and that requires a careful monitoring and a prompt intervention once it is registered. Um, most of the patients with uh, breast cancer uh, of the breast cancer present either with HER2 positive or HER2 negative uh, disease. But there is a gray area of those who have HER2 low. This means immunohistochemistry plus one or plus two, but they are negative on such test. Um, trastuzumab pyroxtecan was explored in this area for those patients with HER2 low breast cancer. In a randomized trial of about 557 patients with HER2 low metastatic breast cancer, the Roxtecan resulted in progression free survival of about 10 months compared to standard of five months for those physician choice treatment. And the median survival reached 23 months versus 17 months for the controls. Based on these results, patient with metastatic HER2 low metastatic breast cancer um, with progression, we recommend trastuzumab deroxtecan rather than next line chemotherapy. Another drug that is trastuzumab ducarmazine, which is also a drug, uh, antibody drug conjugate, uh, link between trastuzumab and ducarmycin, which is alkylating agent. And this in phase one trial showed an overall response rate of about 33%. And in TULIP phase three trial showed uh, in those patients in about 400 37 patients uh, with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer from 11 countries showed a median progression free survival of about seven months, superior to 4.9 months for the physician choice of treatment. Merge Toximab is another anti HER2 treatment. This is a novel FC optimized chimeric monoclonal antibody engineered so that FC domain has increased the ability to bind immunoglobulin GFC receptor on the immune effector cells and mediate 
antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Merge toximab with chemotherapy compared to trastuzumab with chemotherapy in SOPHIA phase three trial. And it showed that overall response rate reached to 25.2% versus 13% and progression-free survival of 29%. Improvement with merge toximab. Bispecific antibodies is also another modality for treatment of those patients with hair to positive metastatic breast cancer, like PRS343, um, being developed to target hair to overexpressing metastatic hair breast metastatic hair to positive breast cancer, directing the immune attack against the cancer cells with potential of immunologic memory development. Uh, the other group of um, anti hair 2 treatment, like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, small molecules. These are approved by FDA in her to positive metastatic breast cancer. The first one approved for this indication was labatinib, which is oral reversible tyrosine kinase inhibitor targeting EGFR as well as HER2. And their unique attribute of crossing the blood brain barrier was promising for those patients with CNS metastasis and um, uh, positive for HER2. In phase three, randomized the trial uh, labatinib with capsaicin produced a progression-free survival of about 8.4 months compared to four months in the standard treatment. Also, neratinib is uh, one of the same group, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, next generation TKI, which is a reversible inhibitor of EGFR and HER2. And in the NALA trial, which is exploring the neratinib plus capsaicin produced the, an overall response rate of 33% compared to 26% with the standard labatinib plus capsaicin. And the duration of response was 8.5 months compared to 5.6 months. Also, pyrotinib is another tyrosine kinase inhibitor of the same group. But the promising results come from the tocatinib trial in her to climb bivotal trial. Uh, tocatinib, when added to standard trastuzumab and the capsaicin, and her to climb over 600 patient trial, the overall survival at two years was about 45% in tocatinib combination group compared to 26% in the placebo group, and survival reached 22 months compared to 17 months. So tocatinib is becoming a new standard of care for her to uh, boost metastatic breast cancer, especially those who see NAS metastasis. Um, two more indications of um, well-known uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Immune checkpoint inhibitors is mainly used in triple negative uh, breast cancer. However, there are several trials exploring the role of immune checkpoint inhibitors. Why? Because HER2 positive breast cancer usually have high expression of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and the frequent expression of BDL1 as well. In phase two Benicia trial, Temporalizumab with trastuzumab was explored in, 20, in 55 patients with advanced her to positive metastatic breast cancer. The combination was safe, and about 15% of 40 BDL1 positive patients achieved an objective response. And moreover, about 200 patients with her to positive uh, metastatic uh, breast cancer in K2 phase 2 trial uh, were. Um, um, explored to have response with TDM1 in combination with atezolizumab, and there was a trend for improvement of progression-free survival of those patients. CDK46 also known to be um, uh, non-medication for treatment of luminal uh, metastatic breast cancer, but they were explored also in this group of patients with uh, her 2 positive metastatic breast cancer. CDK46 are synergistic they have synergistic anti-tumor activity combined with trastuzumab, and they could resensitize resistant tumors to HER2 blockade. And the phase two monarchal study randomized uh, 273, uh, 237 patients with HER2 positive uh, metastatic or advanced breast cancer, uh, giving them the combination apimacyclic trastuzumab and fulvestrin versus apimacyclic with trastuzumab versus chemotherapy plus trastuzumab, the triplet combination therapy of apima, trastuzumab, and fulvestrin produced a superior progression-free survival, especially of about 8.3 months with uh, marginal B-value. And also Patricia phase two trial 
explored the role of palbociclib plus, plus trastuzumab plus or minus letrozole. The benefit of palbociclib and trastuzumab was mostly restricted to or more receptor positive, HER2 positive, or human intrinsic subtype by BAM50 with a better progression free survival. Lastly, the alpha specific phosphonistole 3 kinase. Uh, for those patients with phosphonistole 3 kinase mutation in 30% of, of all HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. In phase one clinical trial of alpelisib plus TDM1 and HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, this combination was tolerable and demonstrated activity with an overall response rate of about 43%. Um, there is ongoing BATINA and EPIC P2 phase three trial evaluating the role of palbocyclib with alpelisib and anti r 2 as maintenance treatment for patients with HER2 positive advanced breast cancer resp after response to anti HER2 plus taxing. There are several biologic markers which should be explored uh, before treatment of those patients with metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer, like, for example, uh, HER2 negative tumors, they have to derive greater benefit from anti HER2 therapies, like in Cleopatra study, Emilia study, and EGF1 uh, 104900. Uh, these studies showed that benefit is mostly with HER2 with hormone receptor negative patients. And also the uh, three tyrosine kinase inhibitor studies like tocatinib, neratinib, avirotinib, and mergetuximab showed benefit in those groups specifically more than the other group. Predictive biomarkers like BDL1 for immune checkpoint inhibitors, BAM50 for CDK46 response, and CRB2 messenger RNA for the benefit of anti HER2, and the phosphonistole 3 kinase somatic mutation for predicting the benefit of alpha specific phosphonistole 3 kinase and genomic uh, tools like plasma circulating tumor DNA uh, being investigated for better monitoring of disease drug efficacy and to know the optimal duration of anti HER2 maintenance therapy. Um, this uh, final um, slide shows the approved FDA or NCCN guidelines for treatment of patients with metastatic breast cancer. Uh, currently for the first line, they indicate trastuzumab with pertuzumab. In second line, TDM1 and uh, deroxtican. In third line, TKIs come uh, like tocatinib, niratinib, and labatinib, and also the use of trastuzumab plus several types of chemotherapy. This concludes our lecture about her to positive metastatic breast cancer. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Yasef, for the nice presentation and all the data, all the collected, all kind of messages regarding the metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer cases. Uh, is there anyone who would like to ask any question for Professor Yasser? Uh, thank you, Professor Yasser, for this uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, HER2 low. Is there any role for uh, any other uh, molecule rather than uh, the can or this is the only uh, molecule uh, who uh, should benefit for HER2 low disease? Uh, to my knowledge, those patients were considered as HER2 negative in the previous studies, and they were treated like uh, those patients with uh, HER2 uh, or treble negative patients, or either uh, if they have um, um, positive hormone receptor, they were treated as such with chemotherapy mainly, and the results were inferior. So the first drug that was explored in this indication uh, was deroxtican, I think, to my knowledge. And, and um, yani, it could improve the survival of those patients, at least in the initial trial. Um, I think uh, they are going to explore a lot of uh, other medication in the future based on this finding. But uh, I think the only, only deroxtican was the first drug to be explored in this indication. For metastatic disease only till now? For metastatic diseases. Uh, uh, is there any hope uh, to have a role on as adjuvant treatment for her too low? Uh, not up till now. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, uh, they know that uh, in this slide. Okay. In the previous. Uh, there was a chart showing the um, percentage of those patients 
in early disease as well as in metastatic setting. Okay. Yes, this shot. Okay, this is in primary tumor therapy for uh, uh, evaluate, uh, evolution of HER2 low between the primary and metastatic. They are less frequent in the uh, early disease, but in metastatic disease, they become more frequent reaching up to 50% of those patients being HER2 one plus or two plus, but they are negative on such examination. Thank you. Uh, so they are more frequent in the metastatic setting because of the development of uh, mutations and uh, progression of this disease. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I want to, uh, to uh, thank Professor Imani, Imani Hilal for inviting me to share this uh, great conference and to, con uh, to congratulate her and all Bahia team for the great success of the fifth breast cancer uh, conference. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Uh, professor Marawan Tolba, uh, he, uh, he is assistant professor in the department at Radiation Oncology, Faculty of Medicine, uh, Dalhousie uh, University, Canada, and he will give us presentation about radiotherapy in breast cancer with low nodal uh, volume, the eternal dilemma. Please proceed, Professor Marwan. Um, 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 do you hear me well? Yeah. It's... Okay, great. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I would love to be with you in person um, to um, chat in person with everyone from my colleagues, friends, and professors, teachers in Egypt. Um, thank you uh, for this invitation and um, um uh, thank you dr ahmed amin and the all the Haya team for um, uh, such an amazing event and inviting me today to um talk about one of the um let's say gray zone um in our practice as radiation oncologists um i hope you can see uh, my screen so i'll i'll talk today about um, uh, the dilemma of um, low volume nodal disease uh, which is um, including the micronodal disease and the real uh, low volume macronodal uh, disease so these are my disclosures as a consultancy and honoraria uh, today i will um, take you through um, the gray zone of the low nodal uh, macroscopic disease and micro uh, nodal uh, disease um, as we all know that breast cancer is one of the most curable diseases in um, oncology uh, when it's treated um, uh, in a multidisciplinary approach and uh, we can classify breast cancer in early stage and locally advanced stage if we looked at the new relatively new classification of the uh, nodal uh, disease we can see the um, two cohorts of patients that present with um, I plus, which is considered as N0 um, in uh, the pathology reports and uh, N1 mite disease, which is uh, greater than 0.2 millimeter, but it's up to two millimeter on the uh, pathology um, uh, this, uh, report. So when women have macro nodal disease uh, with um, 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 one to three lymph nodes on the pathology after breast conserving surgery, we have two main questions. One is related to the surgery uh, itself, and I think it was discussed uh, before whether we proceed with accelerated dissection or we proceed with radiotherapy, and that's um, heavily studied, and we all know that um, uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy now is a standard of care. The other question is, should we uh, treat with um, nodal radiotherapy? Should we escalate the um, whole breast radiotherapy to include the supraclavicular and infraclavicular uh, as well as the internal mammary uh, chain lymph nodes? So the indications in general for regional radiotherapy is T3 or T4 primary lesion or T2 lesion with um, high-grade histology, ER negative lymphovascular space infiltration in case this patient um, lymph nodes um, is um, um, uh, suboptimally evaluated or inadequate 
um, um, dissection of the axilla, we think about regional uh, radiotherapy. So what about one to three um, uh, involved lymph nodes? So there are two big trials in the world that looked at this, the Canadian MA20 trial and the European ERTC 22 uh, trial, Portman uh, trial. So these are big trials, phase three randomized controlled trials that looked at escalating the radiotherapy to whether include the regional nodal uh, fields or uh, just we give whole breast uh, radiotherapy. So from these trials, the uh, MA20 trial showed disease-free survival benefit. Um, uh, that in year uh, disease-free survival benefit was improved to give us results of 82 versus 77%. There was no overall survival uh, improvement though. From the AORTC trial, there was significantly improved the breast cancer mortality rate. And also there was an improved disease-free survival uh, in the initial report of the trial. And at the 15-year update of the uh, Portman trial, there was significant improvement in breast cancer mortality, disease-specific um, mortality, 16% uh, versus um, 19.8%, and also there was a reduction in the probability of breast cancer recurrence um, with the, within the first 15 years that was published last year in Lancet Oncology. However, some advocates may um, uh, tell that there is excellent outcomes in the people with one to three positive lymph nodes, macroscopic disease without regional radiotherapy. So other advocates um, um, and tons of research uh, uh, told us there is um, um, this is not the optimal time of de-escalation of those uh, uh, patients because we have level one evidence to improve the disease-specific survival or decrease the disease-specific mortality and also decrease the local regional recurrence. So let's not forget that in the MA20 trial, 85 85% of those women received the whole breast radiotherapy and they had one to three lymph nodes. Also the ERTC study, 2000 women had one to three positive lymph nodes. So these cohort of patients benefited the most from the uh, escalation of radiotherapy um, uh, design or radiotherapy field. However, now the Canadians are studying the real low risk patients uh, on this uh, in this cohort, which are uh, the luminal A disease, low volume nodal disease, and also the oncotype DX less than 25 or less. And the recent update of this in the trial, the oncotype DX is now accepted as less than 18. This is the uh, concept of the CCTG uh, MA39 trial, which um, uh, randomizes patients into the no regional radiotherapy versus regional radiotherapy. That doesn't mean that those patients don't receive radiotherapy. They receive whole breast radiotherapy, and I will mention this shortly. W let's, let's see the uh, inclusion criteria of these patients. Those patients um, are the T3 N0 disease or less. They have one to three positive lymph nodes. Um, uh, on axillary dissection or one to two positive lymph nodes on sentinel lymph node biopsy with low um, uh, oncotype DX score. And last week, thankfully, I joined the recruiting physicians on this trial here in Halifax. If you see in the NCCN guidelines, the recent version of the NCCN, it's category one um, uh, recommendation to include the regional um, uh, nodes in your field of radiotherapy depending on the level one evidence came from the MA20 and the URTC trial. So for this population, we generally recommend local regional radiotherapy in order to maximize the opportunity and um, 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 uh, decrease the local uh, and regional recurrence in those patients, as well as improving the disease uh, uh, specific survival. Even here at Dalhousie University, our institutional guidelines is um, uh, the recommendation is to treat those patients with regional uh, radiotherapy. Uh, if you're not comfortable with doing this, please include the patient or enroll the patient in the MA39 trial if the patient has microscopic disease. And we will mention this shortly. Please uh, don't add the regional, uh, uh, regional radiotherapy as a routine practice. We have um, additional risk factors to discuss 
and I will mention this shortly. So um, we are treating those patients with regional lymph node irradiation and we escalate the um, radiotherapy treatment in those patients. Uh, recently, there are a bunch of um, papers and tons of research uh, that um, um, tell us uh, we can tailor and individualize our fields so we can maximize our disease control and um, we decrease the toxicity as much as we can. And uh, we suggest that we use the advanced individualized radiotherapy techniques in these patients um, uh, from field extension and design, from your depth of contouring and the contouring differences according to different guidelines, we should all as radiation oncologists know that there are differences according to uh, which practice are you uh, following. However, all practices are um, uh, giving uh, excellent results. If we can see this is the RTOG Atlas and we can see the differences between the RTOG and the RATCOM and uh, the ISTRO uh, uh, contouring guidelines. Um, this is an, um, uh, a maximized image that can show you that there are different guidelines in the contouring just to individualize for each patient if the patient has um, heavy, um, uh, heavily nodal disease, we can uh, use the uh, bigger fields. And if the patient has like um, uh, low nodal disease, we can uh, use the RTOG. If you can see here, this is the RTOG contouring and this is the EURTC, uh, sorry, this is the ESTRO or the RATCOM uh, contouring. They start the internal memory chain um, way higher than the RTOG contouring guidelines. So uh, if the patient received neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, and the patient had have um, uh, uh, the patients have residual nodal disease or they are initially presenting with stage three disease, we don't recommend de-escalation in those patients we treat with regional uh, irradiation. However, in patients presenting with stage two disease, um, those patients whom um, achieved a complete response after therapy. We tailor our, our approach to um, uh, these regional nodes, and we discuss this with the patient actually risks uh, versus toxicity uh, because there is a pending trial and ongoing trials in SABBB51 trial. We need to wait the results before de escalation in those patients. We need to be careful in the patients, especially those patients who receive new adjuvant chemotherapy. But what about the patients with very low volume or micronodal disease? The controversies in the PN0I plus uh, category or the PN1 microscopic nodal disease cohort of patients, this is a dilemma in the whole world. And let's not forget that those patients present uh, in 15% of our cases. And there are two big trials uh, uh, from surgical point of view that explored the whole breast radiotherapy um, uh, with sentinel biopsy uh, versus accelerated dissection. And I think this is studied um, and now the standard of care is to proceed with sentinel lymph node biopsy even in the microscopic disease. Also, we need to remember that when we use the standard tangents, we, when we mention that we uh, treat the breasts with whole breast irradiation, our 95% our 95 of, of the dose covers about 10% of level one and 3% of level two, and 50% of those um, doses cover 50% of level one and 11% of level two. That means uh, these um, um, uh, auxiliary uh, levels receive a um, um, significant amount of our dose and this contributed to the success of the sentinel lymph node biopsy after that in those trials. And if you uh, see in the high tangent uh, uh, procedures uh, like the Z11 trial, they use the high tangents and they increase um, the dose to the axilla as well. So when the people uh, mention that those, pa those patients receive whole breast radiotherapy, that doesn't mean that you don't include the axillary levels. No, you include the axillary levels with um, um, uh, some doses, but the question is if this dose is significant or not. It seems it's a significant dose because the sentinel lymph node trials uh, achieved the non-inferiority um, uh, levels. So there are 
uh, also um, uh, tons of literature that came from the retrospective analyses that looked at the effect of regional radiotherapy in those patients, whether the local regional radiotherapy will uh, improve the outcomes in patients with micronodal disease, and they found no difference actually in the uh, local regional uh, radiotherapy um, escalation. However, a recent analysis from Vancouver, Canada, uh, they uh, found that the escalation in those patients, even in the micronodal disease with local regional uh, radiotherapy, improved the local regional, re uh, local regional uh, recurrence free survival in those patients. And these findings may inform us um, when we discuss with our patients about the uh, toxicity and about the uh, outcomes of the um, escalation uh, for even the micronodal uh, disease. So um, in summary of the micronodal disease, the local regional recurrence in the micronodal metastasis is intermediate between the N0 and N plus disease. So we need to remember that we should tailor and individualize radiotherapy. We can't treat our patients um, as if they are templates or uh, every patient should be go into the case-by-case -case discussion. So this dilemma um, uh, came when the uh, literature told us um, at five years, the local regional recurrence in those patients is about 3%. So the consensus in the world now is not to add regional radiotherapy routinely in the micrometastatic disease, only radiotherapy to the axilla, which means the tangents, if no other risk features um, are included in the pathology report. So other risk features, including the T3 or T4 disease, as well as the T2 tumors um, uh, who had um, limited axillary dissection or inadequate axillary dissection, and uh, also including other risk factors like lymphovascular space infiltration, grade 3 disease, positive surgical margin, triple negative disease. Those patients, even if they have micrometastatic disease, please be careful with them and discuss case by case with the patient and with the uh, colleagues to uh, escalate the dose uh, of radiation with them. So in conclusion, until the evidence comes up from the Canadian MA39 trial, any women with breast conserving therapy um, have any number of macroscopic involved lymph nodes, we suggest addition of regional lymph nodes to standard whole breast radiotherapy. And until that evidence become available, becomes available, and based on what we have in our hands now, we suggest that for the very low nodal volume, micronodal disease, either PNI positive or PNI mic, no routine regional radiotherapy, but tailored case-by-case -case discussion regarding the side effects and the benefits from the treatment. However, that doesn't mean those patients will not receive radiotherapy. No, they will not receive radiotherapy, including the axilla. Here in Dalhousie, we include the axilla, even if the patient um, um, has microscopic disease, but there is risk features, as I mentioned, and that concludes um, uh, my talk today. Thank you. I'll be happy to receive any uh, email from you if you have any question. Thank you, Professor Marwan, for this elegant presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed wants to ask a question. I don't know whether uh, Professor Marawan is us or uh, yeah. with us. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Marawan. Uh, what technique do you prefer? Is it uh, partial white tinge or separate internal mammary field for the regional nodal uh, radiation? So here, um, I, I work in two institutions actually, at McGill in Montreal. We used the tangents. We used wide um, tangents with heart blocking for the regional irradiation. However, when I moved to the house here in Halifax, every patient will receive regional nodal irradiation. We use VMAP technique. So, what do you prefer, or what is the least uh, with the least I, effects? I prefer the VMAP technique. Any questions from the? And thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Abir Shaban, Professor of uh, Pathology and Cancer and Genomics in uh, Birmingham University, UK. Should I?
She will talk about what we do know about microinvasive breast carcinoma. No, it's, it's not this talk that was uploaded, the one before. Yes, this is the correct one. What's showing in front of me is another one. Okay. Good afternoon again. And um, I'm going to, to talk about a completely different topic, which is the microinvasive breast carcinoma, or what we call uh, microinvasion. Uh, so what do we understand by the word microinvasion? So microinvasion refers, refers to a small focus of invasion that is less than one millimeter in size. It usually occurs in the context of high grade DCIS, but that's not exclusive. You can also see it in association with Paget's disease, with LCIS, and also with low and intermediate grade DCIS. If you diagnose it on core biopsy, then we designate it similar to DCIS. So we call it B5A, it's not B5B. Uh, and if on excision, the TNM classification would classify it as PT1 uh, microinvasion. So it's like as an invasive disease. So there is a lot of controversy as to whether this represents uh, a type of DCIS or an early invasive disease. Sometimes, as we said, it can occur in association with non-high-grade DCIS. Also, commonly, it is with high-grade. And this is an example occurring on top of florid LCIS. It is usually a focal lesion. So normally, you would see it in the context of breast screening in a high-grade DCIS, or sometimes symptomatically with a breast mass showing high-grade DCIS and only a small area of invasion. So if we pathologists are not careful enough, we may overlook it. So it needs a lot of um, thoroughness in the examination, particularly when there is associated inflammatory infiltrate that can obscure these, um, these ones. So this is a case that had DCIS only, and then a few years later presented with nodal metastasis, and this is the nodal met. When we went back to the uh, DCIS to review it, uh, we found that there were areas of microinvasion that were missed. So this is what looked like at low power. You can't really tell where it is. And then when you go a bit higher, you identify these small islands that the pathologist at the time did not see. We did deeper levels on this. And actually, we, uh, when we looked back, yes, you can see more of these. And when we did deeper levels, it actually became a true invasive disease. And this was a HER2 positive invasive grade three that was missed because the microinvasions at the beginning was missed. The definition of microinvasion has evolved over the years. It was first described in 1982 um, uh, as an area of invasion of less than one millimeter. And then it developed to uh, look at the relation of invasion to the circumference of the DCIS. Uh, some other definitions described less than two millimeters and some, so what we would call PT1A now. So the definitions have uh, changed over the years, but the current definition in the WHO and in all the guidelines is uh, one millimeter or less of invasion. Uh, in the UK, one of the criteria for diagnosing it was that it has to be outside specialized trauma. So if you look at the area of DCIS and the specialized trauma of the lobule around it, if the focus of invasion was within it, that's not microinvasion. If it went beyond it, that was microinvasion. This um, criterion has been dropped now. So it doesn't matter actually where you find it and you can confirm it by doing uh, smooth muscle immunohistochemistry. Um, and as you see here on the left-hand side, SMM is negative confirming invasion while it's preserved around the DCIS. What about multiple foci of microinvasion? So the guidelines say that we should go for the largest. 
So go for the largest and measure it. If it is still less than one millimeter, it's a micro invasion. Don't add them up, but I would recommend that you do levels to see if they join up and become a bigger focus. So there are lots of unanswered questions about micro invasion. So is it basically in situ or small invasive disease? If we diagnose it on core biopsy, should we do sentinel lymph node biopsy as well? Is it associated with adverse outcome compared with pure GCIS? And what are the parameters that predict outcome in this context? For us as pathologists, it's even more complicated. The definition has changed. The incidence, how many cases, what's the proportion of cases that show microinvasion? Are we consistent in reporting them? Uh, how do we measure them? And how do we report on core biopsy? Um, it is not recommended to use the term suspected or probable microinvasion as much as possible, because that's not a very helpful one. And we, in the UK, we try to avoid that. It's either there or not. Try to avoid, it could be probable or suspected. So this is data from the Sloan project, and this is um, a large national project in the UK named after the late Professor John Sloan, uh, who was uh, a pioneer in breast pathology in the UK and professor in the University of Liverpool. I had the pleasure of working with him briefly as my PhD supervisor. He died suddenly at work at a very young age. So this was done um, after him. And this was a prospective audit of DCIS in the UK. And this is the largest prospective audit of screen detected DCIS in the world. Uh, basically collecting all comprehensive pathology, radiology, uh, surgery, radiotherapy data uh, to um, identify the pathology features and identify variation in diagnosis and management. This ran from 2003 to 2012 with follow-up till now. Um, and we looked at subsequent events following the diagnosis of DCIS and in this case also microinvasive carcinoma. So there were a total of over 11,000 cases of screen detected DCIS. Uh, Microinvasion occurred in 521, giving an incidence of 4.6%. So it's not a common disease. You will not see it that often, but if you see it, don't miss it because it, it can obscure invasive disease. Uh, frequency of reporting microinvasion varied considerably among screening units in the UK. Uh, ranging from zero, so some unit did not report any microinvasive cancer, and some up to 25%. And the over, uh, overall reporting incidence decreased from 7% at the start of the project to 3% at the end. As we expected, it was associated with high-grade DCIS, with larger size of DCIS, and with the presence of comedonecrosis, solid cribriform, and flat architecture of DCIS. So that's where you would expect to see more. If you have a big DCIS, if you have comedonecrosis, high-grade DCIS. Um, it was more often identified in patients who underwent mastectomy. So it looks like when we have microinvasion, their surgeons were more likely to be more aggressive with treatment. And axillary node surgery was also more common in patients with microinvasive carcinoma, and these were all highly significant. Patients with microinvasion who underwent breast conserving surgery were also more likely to receive radiotherapy. Uh, and there was no association between the presence or absence of microinvasion and margin status or margin width in patients who underwent breast conserving surgery. An important question was whether these are associated with nodal metastasis. And we found that the rate of metastasis overall was very low. Uh, it was slightly higher than patients with pure DCIS, but the difference was not significant. So you will get a, a, little, some, a small proportion that is uh, positive for lymph nodes, but the uh, rate is not different compared with pure DCIS. 
We had follow-up data for England for uh, up to nine years. And what was reassuring is that there was very low um, events rate. Uh, so recurrent GCIS 2.3% and invasive carcinoma in only 4.2%. And this was not statistically significant, different from patients with DCIS without microinvasion. This, I think, was the most striking finding that we really didn't expect, that patients who had microinvasion had significantly um, higher mortality from breast cancer compared with women who did not have DCI uh, uh, microinvasion. So basically, this looked like it acted as an invasive disease. Biologically, it was more aggressive than pure DCIS. And you can see the Kaplan Meier survival curve separating, and the difference was statistically highly significant. And this persisted when we um, adjusted for grades. So when we looked at high grade DCIS only versus high grade with microinvasion. Um, what was also interesting is that all subsequent ipsilateral DCIS events were of high grade. So when they recurred as DCIS, they recurred as high grade DCIS. And when they developed invasive cancer, the majority, over two thirds of the cancers, were also of grade three cancers, comparing with only a third in patients with DCIS without microinvasion, again, statistically significant. There was no effect of DCIS size on frequency of recurrences or outcome. So the incident that we found uh, was consistent with the reported literature, which ranged between 5 uh, and 10%. The largest data so far is the SEER data, although not as comprehensive as the Sloan data, and they reported an incidence of 3.2%. Uh, the mortality, the SEER data actually in, in the US found the same thing, that patients with microinvasion had higher breast cancer specific mortality compared with those without. So this shows that the prognosis of DCIS with microinvasion is largely similar to that of invasive small breast cancer and worse than pure DCIS. How about axillary staging? Should we do routinely axillary node sampling or sentinel node biopsy in patients with microinvasion, whether diagnosed on core biopsy or excision. Data in the literature is conflicting and there isn't an established guideline. So some studies recommend sampling of the lymph nodes whenever you identify microinvasion. And that's what we tend to do in Birmingham as well. When we find microinvasion, we would do sentinel node biopsy. Memorial slain data also supported that, and that they found that there was an upgrade to invasion in surgical excision in a large number of cases, even with what they call probable or suspected microinvasion. A recent meta-analysis found there is significant heterogeneity in the literature regarding that, and the survival rate was very similar to, uh, to patients with pure DCIS only, and they concluded that axillary staging is unlikely to change management, and they recommended an MDT approach and case-by-case -case discussion as to whether axillary sentinel node biopsy is required. Factors associated with poor outcome uh, in microinvasive carcinoma in the literature included large DCIS size, comedonecrosis, and number of foci of microinvasion. So if you have multiple foci, the prognosis is likely to be worse. And they also showed that high immune densities of CD4, FOXP3, and CD163 were prognostic. The strength of this uh, study was the large well-characterized cohort, um, all screen detected, very stringent criteria for inclusion and very high quality data collected, long follow-up. But however, we didn't have data on whether microinvasion was diagnosed on core or on excision. We didn't have information on the number of foci because this is not included routinely in the uh, pathology guidelines, either in the UK or globally. Um, the 
M uh, microinvasion definition changed over the years, but actually it did not change the, during the uh, Sloan study period. So just to conclude, microinvasion is most commonly identified in the context of high-grade GCIS, larger GCIS lesion, and in the association with comedonecrosis. Its pathological reporting has decreased over the study period, the 10 years. Patients with DCIS plus microinvasion were more likely to have undergone mastectomy, axillary node surgery, and to have received radiotherapy after breast conserving surgery. Subsequent events were reassuringly few and the prognosis good overall. However, the mortality associated with DCIS and microinvasion was higher, significantly higher compared with DCIS. And this data and other data in the published literature supports managing microinvasive carcinoma similar to small invasive cancer rather than DCIS. In pathological reporting, report DCIS as usual, comment on the presence or absence of microinvasion. If you have multiple foci, mention that they are multiple because this is prognostic, but do not add them up just um, use the largest. Try to do deeper levels to see if these microinvasive foci get bigger and thus would be classified as true invasion. Uh, ER, PR, and HER2, usually you have little to go on, but more recently we have been actually trying to test ER, PR, and HER2 on microinvasive foci and the associated DCIS because there is evidence that, for example, the HER2 positive uh, DCIS with microinvasion behave worse than those uh, that are, for example, ER positive. And if you want to read the full data, this has just been published online in the British Journal of Cancer uh, and also in Nature Portfolio uh, blocks. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Professor Avir. Uh, any questions from the floor? Uh, we notice here in Egypt, we have problem with private labs. The, uh, they are not that meticulous to do many sections to detect the uh, small foci of microinvasion. <laughs> So what is your practice? What, how many sections do you do? How, what is the standard in the UK? Yeah, so in the UK cases with DCIS, generally because when you trim it, you need really to sample it extensively to look for foci of microinvasion. We normally um, X-ray the slices, as Dr. Gada showed earlier. So we would X-ray and sample, do what we call targeted sampling. So we look for the areas of calcification clips and so on. Once we have the sections, we just do one H and E level, but examine it thoroughly particularly if you have a lot of inflammation or distortion, can be difficult. So low power, high power, if there is any suspicion that there is invasion or distortion, or we cannot see the uh, myoepithelial layer well, do levels and do myoepithelial markers. And we, when we do myoepithelial markers, we don't do one, we do at least two. And our preferred ones are a smooth muscle mycin, SMM, and P63, which is a nuclear marker. So one cytoplasmic, one nuclear, both are very specific uh, and rely on both together to identify invasion. If you have a tiny bit of invasion, level them to see how big it is and record the largest size. Takes a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Abir, for this elegant presentation. Because you are running out of time, so I'll call the second speaker, please. The second talk will be about is testing KI67 helpful in treating decision in early breast cancer. This talk will be given by Professor Amani Lan and Professor Rad Al Salam. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you for uh, being with us till this uh, late afternoon. Uh, I'm not going to be very late, and this is uh, the uh, presentation between. Uh, uh, I'll start my presentation. With this uh, very famous slide, I'm sure you all know about this. When we discovered that breast cancer is not a one disease and we have at least four biological subtypes, 
with different prognoses via the genetic profiling. And when we detected this knowledge, uh, the, uh, a lot of questions have raised to the surface. Do all patients need the same treatment? Any subset of patients can be spared chemotherapy. Some patients with high risk features may benefit from more escalation of the treatment. And these come the multi-gene prognostic test in the breast cancer. A lot of uh, the uh, uh, scoring systems, including the Oncotype GX, Mama Brent, uh, BAM50 uh, breast cancer index, uh, some of them or most of them are uh, deprognostic and some of them are used as uh, depredictive for uh, the um, benefit of uh, the escalating or de-escalating the treatment for patients with breast cancer. Uh, these are uh, the uh, NCCN guidelines for the use of uh, the uh, genetic uh, the, uh, testing. Uh, I'll take an example of Oncotype GX, which have been validated in the Taylor X uh, the trial. And this uh, um, uh, uh, Oncotype GX is 21 gene, 16 uh, gene uh, uh, panel genes, and the five reference genes using a score uh, with the, the low score for the low risk disease and the high score for the high risk disease. And those with the low risk benefit only from the endocrine treatment, and these have been um, confirmed, while those with the, the high risk require more aggressive treatment with um, uh, chemotherapy uh, for patients with the N0 or N1 disease or more receptor positive HER2 new negative uh, disease. Uh, look at the deep proliferation genes. The first comes the KI67. KI67 is uh, the expressed strictly associated with the cell proliferation, uh, expressed in the nucleus in the interphase and the surface on the mitosis, and it present in all phases of the cell cycle while it's absent from the resting cell phase. So it's an excellent marker for determining the cross fraction of a given cell population. The problem with the, the genetic testing that it's not available in all countries, it's not available for all centers, and it's very expensive, even it's not validated in all uh, centers. So uh, uh, we all, as oncologists, are trying to find something which is easier uh, or uh, the less expensive to rely on, on the predicting uh, the benefit of uh, the treatment for the patients. KI67 has been proved to be a very good prognostic marker, and this, uh, the um, population-based court uh, of uh, the uh, cancer registry, showing that uh, the uh, uh, recurrence, sorry. Uh, the recurrence was uh, very low for patients with uh, the KI67 less than 15%, while the recurrence is higher for those uh, above uh, the 45%. So as a prognostic marker, it is a very, very good prognosis and has been adapted in a lot of uh, uh, studies in the field of uh, the breast cancer. Uh, he is uh, trying to find the, the um, uh, correlation between the oncotype DX and KI67, so we can rely on the KI67 as in the oncotype DX, and there, there has been found weak to moderate positive correlation between the recurrence score and KI67, and the, um, uh, also with the DPR level. Trying to take uh, the benefit from uh, the uh, uh, knowledge of uh, the KI is a good prognostic, uh, trying to find uh, the uh, response of the KI67 to the uh, endocrine treatment in many of uh, the new adjuvant endocrine treatment studies. This is the first where both menopausal women with a newly diagnosed hormone receptor positive invasive breast cancer randomized to receive two weeks of uh, the aromatase inhibitor before surgery and to continue for two weeks postoperatively while the others go directly to the surgery. And KI67 is uh, the major, the, the uh, ad based line and after the treatment, and it has been found that patients with the, the starting with LOCA I67, ending with LOCA I67, have the best prognosis, and those with the, the uh, starting with high and then responding to the new adjuvant hormonal treatment and turn it into low expression of the KI67 have uh, the five-year absolute risk of recurrence of about 9% compared to about 20% when the KI67 is not, uh, the tumor is not responding to the endocrine treatment as regards the measurement of the KI67. So now uh, the uh, KI67 can uh, the segregate uh, the patients into, again, low risk and high risk and uh, uh, question is whether these high-risk patients could benefit from the more intensive adjuvant treatment uh, and the leaving those uh, with the very low risk away uh, to be spared from uh, the chemotherapy. 
This is uh, the another trial uh, where in ADAPT trial, this is not a randomized. We all patients with uh, the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative received uh, the new adjuvant endocrinal treatment and the baseline recurrence score and KI67 expression were measured centrally. And then uh, the patients were classified into high risk group and low risk group. The low risk group, those with N0 to 1 with the recurrence score between 12 and 25, and those with KI67, both the new, new adjuvant dopamine treatment less than 10%. And these patients were spared the adjuvant chemotherapy and received only endocrinal treatment, while the high-risk group with the BT um, uh, N2 or N3, uh, N0 to 1 with the recurrence score more than 25, and N0 to 1 with the recurrence score 12 to 25, but the KI67 Boston new adjuvant is not responding and is still uh, higher than 10%. And uh, it has been found that patients with a low risk group and received only endocrinal treatment, uh, they do very well. So KI67 acts in combination with the recurrence score to know which patients would benefit from uh, the hormonal treatment only and can be spared chemotherapy. And uh, uh, going more forward, uh, trying to make more benefit from the KI-67 comes uh, the adjuvant trial, Monarch-E, where uh, the um, uh, uh, investigators uh, try to make uh, the information from uh, the level of the KI-67 to give whether CD46 uh, um, uh, inhibitors plus the endocrine treatment as an adjuvant treatment. And they defined the, the uh, high risk group uh, as uh, the, those with more than equal four positive lymph nodes or one to three positive lymph nodes plus histological grade three or tumors larger than five centimeter. Uh, or those with one to three positive lymph nodes and KI67 is more than 20%. These patients were randomized to receive either a BMA cycle plus uh, the um, aromatase inhibitor or only aromatase inhibitor alone. And the uh, primary endpoint primary endpoint was uh, the invasive cease-free survival, uh, and the uh, secondary endpoint was uh, the um, uh, um, overall survival. And uh, it worked. Uh, the uh, KI-67 uh, could segregate, I'm sorry, I'm just trying up. KI-67 uh, can segregate, uh, showed that uh, if it's high more than 20%, the patient did benefited from adding the abimacyclib to the hormonal treatment. Uh, the, uh, detecting the high-risk population, receiving more aggressive treatment, and get benefit from such an aggressive treatment regarding the invasive cease-free survival and uh, distant uh, cease-free survival. Uh, there is no difference in the overall uh, survival, and I think we need a longer follow-up to detect if there is any uh, benefit from adding the abima cyclib to the um, uh, uh, hormonal treatment in this high-risk group. Now, the, uh, for the first time, we have a clear guideline from uh, the ASCO and the NCCN to use uh, the uh, uh, KI67 as uh, the predictive marker. And when it's higher than 20%, we can add a BMA cyclib to the uh, hormonal treatment. The problem with the KI67 testing is uh, the um, lack of standardization. This is not of our business as a clinician. Uh, this is the business of pathologists and we are waiting for Dr. Gaida to tell us what should we do. But what matters for us is there is no standard cutoff value. Look at this difference, existing guidelines. St. Gallen in 2011 said that tumors with KI67 less than 14% can be considered as luminal A and can be treated only with hormonal treatment. While those above, 14% is considered to, be considered to be high risk. And then in 2013, they changed their mind and use a cutoff point of 20%. And then 2021, they said no. KI67 less than five is a clear low risk. And KI67 above 30% is clear high risk. And between five and 30, you need another modality of the helping, which is the, the again, the genetic uh, testing, which is, not available in everywhere. In the ESMO guidelines, she didn't want to take that uh, uh, risk and said uh, a KI67 could be low or high according to the laboratory findings of each center. 
This is the ASCO guidelines for the first time saying that if the uh, KI67 is above 20%, give abimacyclib in the adjuvant setting. And uh, said it, you could, we could use KI67 response to the new adjuvant treatment to segregate patient. They don't give a very clear statement if the patient is responding to the new adjuvant treatment as regarding the measurement of KI67, we can spare patients uh, the uh, chemotherapy and go into the endocrine treatment. So I think we're still in a very big dilemma, uh, uh, which cutoff point we should use to know which patient is low risk and which patient is high risk. A lot of uh, the uh, studies showing some are high uh, uh, using cutoff point 10%, 14%, 20%, 30%. And in the triple negative, it has been used also as a prognostic marker showing that ki 6 7 above 40%, this is a very high risk for uh, the triple negative disease. So the clinical utility of ki 6 7 is evident only in the anatomically favorable ER positive and HER2 new negative patients. At present, there is no clear uh, consensus on ki 6 7 score that would differentiate a patient at high or lower risk of disease recurrence. The international KI67 working group uh, consensus was that uh, stated that KI67 level of 5% or below uh, uh, and 30% or greater could be used to estimate prognosis and determine uh, the uh, uh, use of the adjuvant chemotherapy. For tumors with KI67 index between these values, the group recommended using a commercially available multi-gene expression panel. Now I leave uh, the uh, uh, space to the pathologist to tell us what should we do with this dilemma. Please, Dr. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Amini, for letting me share with you this topic. Okay. Uh, uh, so in my talk, so in my talk, um, I will start with a brief introduction about KI67 and what is meant by KI67 labeling index. Then we'll discuss with you the possible, the possible reasons why uh, there is inter and intra-laboratory variations on scoring. Uh, then I will discuss with you the possible reasons why there is inter and intra-laboratory variations uh, in uh, scoring the same slide. And finally, we'll give you an idea about uh, the different counting methods we use. Uh, KI67 is a nuclear expressed antigen that's mainly assessed by immunohistochemistry. Okay. And uh, as Dr. Amani said, it's uh, expressed in all cell cycles phases, uh, except the resting phase, uh, GO. So it's an excellent biomarker for determining the gross fraction of a given uh, cell population with the, uh, the peak level usually uh, is, in the, uh, is seen in the mitotic phase. KI67 index is defined as a percentage of positively stained tumor cells among the total number of invasive cells in the scored area. It has attracted increasing attention in the recent years. Studies showed that KI67 expression level can predict the tumor prognosis and therapy response. Although there is a, a usual, although it's a usual biomarker for differentiating luminal A from luminal B, um, a subtype of breast cancer, but there is no established cutoff point. Um, in 2011, St. Gallen consensus advocated a cutoff value of 14%. However, they changed this recommendation. However, they changed this recommendation at uh, the 2013 consensus. Uh, while most of the panel suggested a threshold of 20% or more for high KI67 status, others were more concerned about the large inter 
and the intralaboratory variation in the measurement. And they recommended they recommended that each laboratory should set its cutoff value independently. So measurement and interpretation of KI67, however, remain a tremendous challenge for pathologists. When we look at recent studies on KI67, you will see that the number one issue here is the significant inter and the intralaboratory um, uh, observer variability in the interpretation of KI67. The reason is that um, there are many factors that can affect the result. First, a pre-analytical factors, which include sample collection, where samples should be um, uh, fixed in 10% neutral buffer formalin for six to 72 hours, not less than this and uh, not more than 72 hours. Um, in a study done by Arima and colleagues, as it is shown in figure one, it showed that insufficient fixation caused a drastic reduction in the KI67 from 33% to 5%. And in figure two, it rep uh, represents the effect of prolonged tissue fixation, which caused a gradual reduction in the KI67 index in a time-dependent manner. Also processing and archiving of the specimen can affect the interpretation. The immunohistochemistry is better to be performed only within five years from the time of tumor placement into the paraffin block because this will uh, affect the antigen and it will uh, cause antigen decay. And regarding the specimen type, some data suggest that using sections from excised specimen may give higher scores than core biopsy. However, core needle biopsy is much preferred, of course, because uh, it's usually um, better uh, fixed than specimen. Other considerations about the analytical methods and reporting, and I will discuss with this, this with you now. And finally, post-analytical issues to ensure ongoing equality of the analytical assessment. Regarding the analytical consideration, there are two main methods for KI67 evaluation, manual and automated counting. Manual counting includes two methods, either counting in hotspots only or the I, what's called eyeballing or uh, global average estimation of the entire slide. In the hotspots method, pathologists focused on the analysis of hotspots only, which are the area with the highest number of positive nuclei, sparing low or negative areas. And to count as many as 1,000 tumor cells to get the percentage. And for the purpose of prognostic evaluation, the invasive edge of the tumor should be scored. In 2011, uh, a modification on this uh, uh, method is recommended by the International KI Working Group. They recommended to record first the average score uh, to assess the entire slide and get the average score, uh, and then choose at least three high power fields, including hotspot, and count up to 1,000 tumor cells. So accordingly, going back to the previously shown case, it should be counted as, as it is shown here to select three different, hot, uh, different staining intensity where hotspot in, is included in one of them. This is another example of counting tumor with heterogeneous KI67 expressions, three representative areas were selected to be uh, counted, including one hotspot, which is number one. The other method is the global estimation method or what is known as eyeballing method. In this method, a global estimation across the entire slide is done without specific counting. So what is the most valid, the eyeballing or counting in hotspots? It's still controversial whether eyeballing method or counting on hotspots gives a better reading. The eyeballing method is perfect, especially if the staining of course is homogeneous. But in heterogeneous cases where some areas are interrupted by hotspots, and it may lose its validity because some pathologists can ignore 
some of the hotspots area and the others can count this. So it will give variation in scoring. Additionally, these two manual counting methods are subjective and also depends on the experience of the pathologist. The International KI Working Group found a higher reproducibility for the eyeballing method, although the difference was not statistically significant. The second method is the automatic counting using computer software, and this may be more promising alternative method for KI scoring. Although this method makes the task more objective and efficient, the final result is the KI sum and not the percentage, which may not reflect actual, the actual true biologic impact of the KI67 because the sum is influenced by the number of tumor cells in the specifically um, uh, scored area. It's unknown whether manual or automatic counting method is superior. Automated scoring is still investigational till now, but evidence to date suggests that automated scoring is not worse than standardized uh, visual scoring for core cuts. In the last year, 2021, the International KI Working Group constructed and validated a new standardized scoring method for KI67 scoring. Using either a light microscopy or digital slide, the group offer an online scoring application. This. A pathologist add the estimate of the percent area for each negative, low, median, and high KI in the same slide. Then after this, the pathologist will be asked to score about 100 tumor cells in each field. Then the application will calculate the weighted global score. Although this method is valid and reproducible, it's also challenging to be achieved as a routine in pathology laboratory because some found this uh, method is a tedious one and require training on calibration set and software and spending long time to score each slide with a median of nine to 10 minutes to score just a single slide. Thus, for this reason, the clinical utility of KI immunohistochemistry in breast cancer care remains limited to prognosis, assessment in stage one and stage two breast cancer. Further development of automated scoring might help to overcome these issues. And thank you. Dr. Gada, may have a small question, but uh, when you receive five cores, for example, for bespecimen, you analyze the five cores or you just for KI67 or you just choose one of them. Also, the side of the specimen was from the center of the peripheral. I think there is some difference between the KI between these. Yes, yeah. It will be different from uh, assessing the specimen because in the specimen, I usually go for the invasive edge of the tumor and count this. Um, it depends on the way of you, you count. Either for the five cores, if I will use the eyeballing method, I will go roughly estimating all the five cores and uh, pick the percentage for this. But if I will choose the hotspots, I will go for the five cores and select the most uh, positively stained areas and count in these areas to select uh, thousand tumor cells and counting in this area. Uh, now uh, going to the Pfizer uh, symposium, uh, 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 it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Ahmed Bastawisi, the professor of medical oncology, uh, um, NCI, and the um, uh, consultant of medical oncology in Bahia Hospital. Please, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Mr. The Chairman. I would like to thank all the organizers uh, and all the team of Pfizer for inviting me. 
So my talk is titled CDK46, Real World Confidence. I will start with a small introduction and then I will go through the data of overall survival in Paloma 2 trial. And, uh, and then I will go through uh, overview of real world studies with Palbo and the finally conclusions. And the issue is that all of us know that CDK46 inhibitors show uh, improvement in, of progression free survival. Uh, and all of CDK46 inhibitors improved overall survival uh, apart from uh, uh, palpo cyclib. And this is why I am I gonna discuss um, the value of pal palpo regarding overall survival. So what we know from uh, uh, clinical trials from Paloma 2 is that uh, Palbo was the first CDK46 inhibitor approved for the treatment of ER positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer based on the results of Paloma 1 in the year 2015. And then in the Paloma 2, which was a randomized double blind uh, phase 3 study, it, it demonstrated a significant improvement in progression free survival, survival confirming the data of Paloma 1. Uh, and after a median of 23 months, the median PFS was 24.8 versus only 14.5 months with hormonal treatment with a significant hazard ratio of 0.58. And at that time, the overall survival data was not mature. Uh, and then final overall survival analysis was performed after uh, required events we reached and the results of this analysis is demonstrated in this clinical trial. If we look back at the eligibility criteria for Paloma 2, it, it included patients with postmenopausal women, advanced breast cancer, ER positive, HER2 negative, ECOG performance status of zero to two with no prior treatment allowed in the advanced disease. And the patients we randomized in a two to one fashion to either Palbo in a standard dose of 125 milligram per day, three weeks on, one week off, plus hormonal treatment, letrozole versus letrozole alone, with a primary endpoint of investigator assessed PFS and secondary endpoint of OS response safety biomarker and the patient related outcomes. And then I invite you to look carefully at the statistical assumptions. It was for PFS, which was the primary endpoint. The study assumed a sample size determined to detect around 44% in improvement in median progression free survival from nine months for the control up to 13 months for the palpo arm. Whereas the statistical assumption for overall survival as a secondary endpoint was assuming a control arm uh, of a median overall survival of uh, 34 months uh, up to 46 months was around 35 percent improvement required in order to elicit significance in overall survival, which means that the criteria of overall survival significance in Paloma 2 was more or less a very um, unfair uh, assumptions. And if we look at the uh, patient's characteristics in both arms, it was more or less matched with a median age of around 62 in both arms and the ECOG performance status of zero in the uh, slim majority of patients. Visceral disease was present in around 50% of all patients and the disease-free interval was more than one year in around 40% of patients in both arms and the patients receiving a prior endocrine therapy in a slim majority of patients more than 50% whereas other systemic treatment uh, were, receive, were received in the majority of patients in both arms. And if we look at the survival disposition of the total uh, intended to treat population, which were more than 600 patients randomized in a two to one fashion, if we look at the left side of the slide for the palbo uh, letrozole, the missing survival data was 13%, whereas the missing survival data for the other arm was around 21%. Around one fifth of the, uh, of the data was missing, which means that when we are driving overall survival data, we shouldn't forget about this uh, important issue because, because if we have one fifth percent of data missing, we cannot expect to elicit survival difference. And so it was not surprising for me to have overall survival curves overlapping, denoting a new statistical significance in favor of Palbo. However, it was numerically higher 53.9 versus 51.2. But if we look at uh, a post-hoc sensitivity analysis for patients 
after exclusion of patients with uh, missing data, it was once again not surprising to have a survival difference in favor of uh, palpo arm 51.6 versus only 44.6 in the hormonal treatment only arm with a hazard ratio 0.86. Again, if we look at patients receiving post-study systemic therapies, more than 12% of patients received uh, in the uh, palpo arm and more than 27% in the hormonal treatment only arm received uh, CDK46 palpocytes, which means that uh, still we have uh, a, a good uh, percentage of patients on continuing on CDK46 palpo after discontinuation of the study. Perhaps one of, the most in, one of the most important endpoints for patients and subsequently for physicians is the time to chemotherapy because the majority of patients are concerned mainly about, the, about how to delay uh, timing of chemotherapy. And if we look at the curves for timing to chemotherapy, it was uh, definitely in favor of Balbo, where the median time was 38.1 months versus only 29.8 months in favor of Balbo based on. Again, if we look at uh, combined overall survival analysis for both Paloma 1 and Paloma 2, in the subgroup of patients with disease-free interval of more than one year, which may be more prone to hormonal treatment, again, we can notice that median overall survival was 64 in the Balbo arm versus only 44.6, with a hazard ratio of 0.73, corresponding to 27% decrease in the incidence of death with the use of Balbo as compared to hormonal treatment only. So the conclusion for this uh, Paloma trials is that Paloma 2 met its primary endpoint of improving progression-free survival and the other secondary endpoints, including overall response rate of around 53, uh, 55.3 versus only 44.4 in the hormonal treatment arm. Again, the safety profile in the palpolitrozole remains consistent with long-term use without evidence of cumulative toxicity and the, and the quality of life was maintained. Regarding the issue of overall survival, it was numerically longer in favor of Balbo uh, arm. However, it was not statistically significant. The median survival was, but remember that the median survival was over 50 months in this population which is a significant improvement in the natural history of HR-positive breast cancer disease. Uh, and, is, and it is especially highlighted in the subgroup of patients with a disease-free interval of more than one year. Again, if we look at the uh, um, uh, follow-up data, we can notice that 10% of patients continued to receive balbolitrozole in the study after 7.5 years of follow-up. Again, interpretation of overall survival in Paloma 2 is limited by the large and the disproportionate percentage of patients with a missing survival data between the treatment arm. So it is unfair to, to talk about uh, absence of overall survival data in the Paloma 2 and, and, and tell that the overall survival is only with the other two CDK46 inhibitors. So from randomized clinical trial data, we have a primary endpoint achieved in, in both Paloma 2, which included ferrostaline palbolitrozole in postmenopausal women with advanced ER positive HER2 negative, and also in Paloma 3 with balbofulvestrant in patients progressing following endocrine therapy. And, and based on improvement in uh, uh, first, in the primary endpoint in both trials, the regulatory approvers was achieved for palbocyclic. If we move from the data from clinical trials to the data from real world, which, which I do believe of very utmost importance in this, in this uh, population, what is the difference between real world and randomized clinical trials? Randomized cl clinical trials definitely measure the efficacy, safety in a specific patient population, and it is designed to show causality, uses uniformly assessed endpoint, which is a privilege. Uh, randomization is there, which is once again a privilege, uh, and it is conducted in a highly monitored, controlled environment. On the other hand, the real-world observational studies show a measure effectiveness and the safety of one uh, approach. It, it, it is not designed to show causality. It is not a hypothesis generating, generating a method. Again, it assesses patient reported outcomes such as quality of life, satisfaction with therapy in the real world setting. Because one of the criticisms for uh, randomized clinical trial is that the inclusion criteria are very restricted. 
we are driving a very selected population. For example, the majority of clinical trials exclude the patients more than 70 years, exclude the patients with CNS disease, if not controlled. So, so, so real world data allows us to include more patients uh, matched with the real practice. Um, and the issue of, of non-randomization, which is a very good uh, criticism for real world da data is now uh, solved by some sophisticated uh, statistical methods, uh, as I will show you just now. Uh, and I invite you to remember that the approval of some indications for certain drugs was not based on a randomized clinical trials. It was, run it was based on real world data. For example, the approval of, the approval of PALBO uh, in men was uh, not based on a randomized clinical trial, but was based on real world data from three databases, the IQ via insurance database and the Flatter and Health Breast Cancer database and Pfizer Global Safety database. So real world data can, be, can now be used for regulatory approvals. And I will go through some of these real world data, which includes several scenarios, including several countries or single country like expanded access program. Uh, some of these real world uh, trials were uh, prospective like Polaris trial. But I will uh, focus on a flattering comparative data analysis because it, it has a unique design. It is a retrospective analysis of electronic health records from uh, flattering health longitudinal database from US community physician, which is a representative of the real practice in the States. It includes the patients with uh, HR positive HER2 negative metastatic disease uh, receiving a palpolitrozole or retrozole alone. Uh, and uh, uh, when we uh, assess the outcome, it was based on real world PFS uh, from a starting of palpolitrozole or retrozole until death or disease progression, more or less similar to clinical trials. And the statistical methods used a, a very important matching modality, which is propensity score matching in order to omit the non-randomization bias. And if we look at the real world progression free survival, it was matched with what we uh, met in the clinic and randomized the clinical trial. And it was in favor of palpo arm with a median uh, real world PFS of 24.5 months versus only 17.1 with a hazard ratio 0.68 around the 32% decrease in the incidence of progression or death with the use of balbo based arm. But what is more important is that if we look at overall survival data in, a, in an example of real world uh, um, study, the, uh, on the left side of the screen, the unadjusted analysis in which the uh, randomization bias is not omitted. And if we look at the median overall survival, it was not reached in the balbo arm whereas it was 14.3 in the uh, hormonal treatment only arm. And if we do uh, omission of, the, of randomization bias by uh, PSM, again, it was in favor of Balbo also with a median overall survival not reached versus only 38.1 in the hormonal treatment arm. So here in the real world data, we are having improvement in overall survival. If we look at another analysis, P-reality, which is part of uh, several uh, uh, real world studies, including several scenarios, some of which like IRIS is in included 12 countries with more than 2,700 2, patients. Uh, and some of these uh, real world data was linked to a single country, but I will focus once again on P-Reality X, which, which was a study of PALBU in real world first line comparative effectiveness study. The objective of this analysis was to evaluate the effectiveness of first-line palbo uh, aromatase inhibitor as compared with aromatase inhibitor alone in patients with HR-positive HER2-negative metastatic breast cancer treated in real-world clinical practice in the States. It was a retrospective cohort analysis of electronic health records within this, the U.S. Flatter and Health Analytical uh, Database. Uh, and it, it included patients in uh, uh, postmenopausal women and the men aged more than or equals 18 years with HR positive HER2 negative metastatic disease, more than 2,800 patients included. Uh, in the palbo arm, more than 1,300, and the, the hormonal treatment only arm, 1,500, and the end point was. Uh, a primary one of overall survival. Remember in randomized clinical trial, the overall survival was a secondary endpoint. Here, 
It is a primary endpoint. And secondary endpoint was real world PFS. What is more important is the statistical analysis. Because first, the analyzed, unadjusted uh, analysis uh, uh, first, and then two methods of uh, matching the two arms in order to omit the randomization bias we, we conducted, uh, like um, the, uh, the uh, first one, uh, which was uh, SIPTW, I will come to it uh, shortly, and the other one, like in the previous real world analysis, the PSM, uh, which was conducted in order to do sensitivity analysis. Median survival time was assessed once again. And if we look at the um, health records from the flattering uh, electronic health data, the size of the database included over 3 million patients' records. Again, 3 million patients' records, which is impossible to randomize in a clinical trial, highlighting the value of assessing real world data. 75% of this analysis was a community practice in the States and 25% from academic cancer centers. So the beauty of this analysis is that it merges the accuracy and the uh, sticking to the guidelines in the academic centers with uh, what is occurring really in, in real practice was around the 75% coming from community practice. It reflected the experience uh, according across clinical settings, more than 280 community cancer centers and the seven major American academic centers. Uh, it is a single common database with a systematic approach to data extraction. It comprises millions of electronic health records in a one consistent platform. The technology enabled the abstraction process as shown here. The electronic health records included structured and unstructured data. And the structured data, uh, well, meaning data organized in a predefined manner, such as drop down fields in the electronic health records, like diagnosis, visits, demographics, lab therapies, and so on. Whereas unstructured data was data not organized in a pre existing data model, such as free text, progression, uh, uh, progressive notes, and so on. And it includes the physician notes, discharge note, radiology, pathology. Uh, and the drive the data was uh, defined as data created based on applying specific algorithms to combine structured and, and the unstructured data in electronic health records. So it is well designed. And the, in the, for the first time, they introduced what is called stabilized inverse probability treatment weight, uh, weight, uh, weighting, SIPTW, which is a, a very sophisticated statistical approach, increasingly used in retrospective real world trials, aiming at weight, weighting differently in the same sample uh, the patients in order to create two cohorts that have balanced characteristics. Um, it is calculated using a propensity score, and the aim of that is to omit the randomization bias. And if we look at the results, this is the overall survival. On the left side of the screen, the unadjusted analysis in favor of Balbo versus hormonal treatment alone with a median overall survival of 53.4 versus 40.4 in favor of Balbo. And if we look at the right side of the screen, the two adjusted modalities showing again uh, maintenance of improvement of overall survival in favor of Balbo as compared to uh, hormonal treatment uh, only. So regardless of being adjusted or unadjusted in the real world data in a, a very large electronic records, we have superiority in favor of Balbo as compared to hormonal treatment alone. If we look at real world PFS, again, on the left side, the median PFS in unadjusted analysis, 19.8 versus only 13.9 with a hazard ratio of 0.68. And on the right side of the screen, we have two modalities of random of uh, omitting bias, the PSM and the SIPTW. And again, the curves are in favor of Balbo as compared to hormonal treatment alone with uh, a more or less similar figures in median real world PFS. If we look at subsequent second line anti-cancer treatments, uh, CDK46 inhibitors was received in around 50% in hormonal treatment uh, arm alone, which seems logic, and it was received in around 43.1 uh, in the palpable arm. 
So what are the strengths of peer reality X? It is a large sample size drawn from an extensive database comprising more than 3 million patient records from over more than 280 community cancer centers, seven major academics. Uh, it captures and uh, processes detailed patient level data, such as demographics, diagnostic information, extent of the disease, lab values, treatments. There was availability of comparative control arms that allows comparison of treatments similar to randomized clinical trial after adjusting for potential confounding factors. Follow-up time was sufficient as compared to some randomized clinical trial. And the use of sophisticated statistical techniques such as SIPTW and the PSM uh, allow for balancing the two arms. So the conclusion from this large uh, analysis is that in a real world study, palbo aromatase inhibitor is more effective than aromatase, uh, in, uh, uh, aromatase inhibitors alone. And this evidence supports the use of palbo in combination with aromatase inhibitor as a standard of care for first line treatment in, of patients with HR positive HER2 negative disease. Last part, I invite you to look at the adverse events of other CDK4-6 inhibitors because palbo ribo, yes, neutropenia is there, but as we as oncologists know that neutropenia of CDK4-6 inhibitors are uh, more or less benign neutropenia, but RIBO, uh, uh, we have QT interval prolongation around 3.3%, liver toxicity in 6.8%, and the ECG is recommended, which may be uh, more or less uh, uh, or, or, or of some concern for the patients. Again, we have the grade three toxicity diarrhea in around the three, and around 37%, one third of patients experience agree to and more diarrhea in Monarch 3. So what I wanted to say is that, uh, again, venous thromboembolism events are more with apima as compared to uh, hormonal treatment alone. So what I want to say is that other CDK4-6 inhibitors have uh, more or less demanding adverse events like uh, diarrhea, like venous thromboembolism, like, um, like prolongation of QT interval, whereas the adverse events of Balbo, which are mainly neutropenia, more or less terrible. And so to sum up, real world data adds to the body of evidence for therapeutic agents and it expanded the use into patient groups not typically representable in, uh, represented in clinical trials. Balbo has a large, broadly representative evidence based with multiple real world studies ongoing around the world. The real world effectiveness outcomes with Balbo complement what has been demonstrated in clinical trial. Again, dosing and the frequency of those adjustment for Balbo in real world studies are as expected based on clinical trial experience. Real world studies of Balbo and the other CDK4-6 inhibitors are beginning to elucidate sequencing patterns in clinical practice. And so finally, it, it is unfair to tell about the uh, lack of overall survival in randomized uh, clinical trial for PALBO after we uh, show with the improvement of that overall survival in real world data. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Professor Ahmed, I think the time is too late to have any other questions, so we'll discuss it together in the dinner, dinner please. Yeah, yeah, best option, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs>